sports stars have managers to handle their affairs, sorting those behind-the-scenes deals, angling for good paydays, maybe even bribing an official or two. Who's to say? With professional wrestling having the pretense of a real legitimate sport, then it's no big surprise that managers play a big role in the world of sports entertainment too, and can be that little ingredient to help a lukewarm feud become must-see action. Primarily means for a heel to gain extra heat due to outside interference or a mouthpiece to cover for a weak talker, managers are an indispensable part of the wrestling landscape. Even face managers, although somewhat less common, can be effective tools, whether scorned by heel clients and out for revenge, or again there to cut a promo when a bland face just can't do it. When it comes to managers in WWE, it is an inconsistent affair. From the highs of the 80s, where several Hall of Fame-worthy agents looked after the interests of a myriad of stars through the middling mid-2000s and beyond, where traditional bosses became a rarity and everyone on the roster had to lace up their boots to justify their paycheck, the role of managers and hangers-on has gone through many major changes. But who is the best? Let's rank them and see, shall we? Before we start, we have some ground rules to stop you horrible lot going feral in the comments, and also just to make life a little bit easier for us. We are only ranking managers who worked on TV from the Rock and Wrestling Connection in 1984 onwards. So unfortunately, this means the legendary Arnold Skoland and the Grand Wizard Ernie Roth both miss out. Surefire top 10 entries otherwise. We are only considering acts that appeared on main roster WWE programming, including WWE CW. So no NXT, OVW, FCW, nor WWE-owned properties such as WCW, AWA, or Classic ECW. For managers that spanned multiple promotions, we are only looking at their WWE main roster work. As for what constitutes a manager, pre-1996 it's rather simple, but after that it gets a bit murky. So valets, associates, assistants, sommeliers, image consultants, caddies, even bodyguards, hired goons, and stooges are up for consideration. Basically, if they were ringside in a non-wrestling capacity, they are in the conversation. We call this the China rule, because let's face it, if we didn't include the ninth wonder of the world on this list, there would be absolute murder. However, we will not be looking at one-night-only managers or celebrity guests, so no Ozzy Osbourne, no Hugh Jackman, no Alice Cooper, Pamela Anderson, Scooby-Doo, or Ricky Steamboat's baby son. Nor will we be counting injured stablemates with nothing to do slash tag partners who hung around at ringside for singles matches, just the gimmicks and performance who were there first and foremost as an addition to an established act. Also, no animals, obviously, or mascots like the bunny or the swagger soaring eagle, as we don't know if it was the same performers under the mask week in, week out. Plus, we have to draw a line somewhere. These rules are tenuous at best, and some of these placements seemingly arbitrary. As for how we are ranking everyone, we are looking at a mixture of kayfabe success, popularity, influence, legacy, and how many top-tier clients they were associated with. Performer X may have had less lasting impact than Y, but if they helped their client attain gold, then that has to be considered. That all clear? Good. Now, shut up, grab a drink, procure a snack, and buckle up. This is going to be a long one. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and this is every WWE manager ranked from worst to best. Join us. Number 219, Jackson Andrews. Anyone remember Jackson Andrews? No? Wikipedia says that on December 6th, 2010, an unidentified bodyguard accompanied Tyson Kidd on Raw and attacked D.H. Smith. December 13th, he was introduced as Jackson Andrews. December 27th, Andrews had an in-ring confrontation with Mark Henry, but ate a world's strongest slam. No recollection. Number 218, The Bodyguard. Despite having Marlena at his side, Goldust also decided that he needed a bodyguard to watch his beautiful golden back and enlisted an unmasked Mantar as the bodyguard. He was useless, and in his one appearance got stripped and slapped about by the Ultimate Warrior at In Your House 7, with WWE subsequently scrapping the role. Number 217, The Usher. But before the bodyguard and Marlena, Goldust had The Usher, a wimpy looking fella dressed as a classic classic cinema usher. All he did was occasionally stand near Goldust and delivered love letters and flowers to Razor Ramon on Goldie's behalf, earning a slapping from the bad guy for his trouble.
Rebels. Number 216, Lamont. The dance partner and personal ring announcer of Ernest Miller, Lamont just wiggled about like a madman in a bad wig, even getting eliminated mid-dance from the 2004 Royal Rumble despite not being an official entrance. Before he befriended Miller, Lamont was the APA's personal butler, Bruce. Number 215, Muffy. Take Simon Dean, add some early Trish Stratus, and voila, you have Muffy. Who the hell is Muffy? Well, for about 20 minutes in 2000, Muffy was Stephanie McMahon Helmsley's personal trainer before being quietly written off TV. We can't go implying that a McMahon is out of shape, damn it. Number 214, Hunter Hearst Helmsley's Valets. When Hunter Hearst Helmsley was still a Greenwich snob, he started to show off that he was a bit of a shagger by having various glamorous women accompany him to the ring. Each week, he would have a new boo, with the most notable being Sable, who accompanied Hunter to his squash loss against the Ultimate Warrior at WrestleMania 12. Number 213, Cloudy. When Heel Sunny left face body donners in the dust in 1996, they replaced her with Cloudy, get it? After a period where Skip and Zip asked WWE fans to apply for the job. A muscly man in drag, Cloudy was a blink and you'll miss it gig for Chris Candido's real life mate, Jimmy Shoulders. Great name, that. Number 212, Angelo Mosca. A former WWE Championship contender in the 70s and 80s, Angelo Mosca transitioned out of the ring and into the commentary booth and briefly ringside for his son, Angelo Mosca Jr. Angelo Jr. had two televised matches in January 1985, and that was it. Number 211, Tiger Jeet Singh. When Tiger Ali Singh turned up in 1997, he had his dad, hardcore legend Tiger Jeet Singh, in his corner. Unfortunately, Singh Sr. didn't have his sword with him, and didn't do much in general, and left WWE after several appearances when the Tiger Ali Singh experiment was ended. Number 210, The Commandant. Looking a bit like Murray from Flight of the Concords, the Commandant came in as the leader of the Militaristic Truth Commission in 1997. However, the Commandant was an actor and not a trained wrestler in any way, and after refusing to take any bumps, he was replaced with the Jackal. Number 209, Amy Zidian. America's favorite cowboy, Jimmy Wang Yang, needed himself a partner, so Amy Zidian grabbed her Daisy Dukes and saddled up. Unfortunately, green as grass Zidian ruffled feathers backstage stage when she openly admitted that she had no idea who Vicky Guerrero and Stephanie McMahon were, and was promptly yeeted from the company. Number 208, Mrs. Cleavage slash Mariana. Sick of being a headbanger, Mosh became Chaz Beaver Cleavage, and it was insinuated that he enjoyed a taboo relationship with his own mother. The angle was soon dropped in favor of Mrs. Cleavage being revealed as Chaz's girlfriend, Mariana, with allegations that Chaz was abusing her. Moving swiftly on. Number 207, Lena Yarda. After one appearance on SmackDown, Lena Yarda joined ECW, decided to turn heel, and allied with Layla and Victoria because she didn't like Kelly Kelly. This lasted a couple of weeks before Yarda said, bored now, and returned to her duties as a backstage interviewer. Number 206, B-Fab and Ashanti the Adonis. After a whirlwind run in NXT, Hit Row were called up to Maine, and everything quickly fell off a cliff. The quartet hung around a bit back stage, and then WWE said, nah, BFAB can go. Then, after one match on SmackDown with Ashante the Adonis at ringside hyping everyone up, the rest of the crew were let go too. The group, Sans Swerve Strickland, were later brought back by Papa H, but it hasn't really been that great. Number 205, Red Dog. As John Cena was finding his feet as the Doctor of Thugonomics, he had the ultimate hype man by his side, B-squared, until he binned him off in favor of Red Dog. Red Dog lasted one week in the role until he was moved over to Raw, where he became better known as Rodney Mack. Number 204, Jameson. Feeble, insecure, weak, tie-chewing nerd Jameson briefly hung around the Bushwhackers in 1992 and wanted to fight the Genius. Now, if I had a time machine, I would travel back to 1992 and join the Genius in flushing this sorry geek's head down the toilet. 
Also, you 100% know that Jameson is how Vince McMahon views all wrestling fans. Number 203, The Funkettes. WWE signed innovative high flyer Too Cold Scorpio from ECW in 1996, turned him into Flash Funk, and gave him the Funkettes to help him dance down to ringside. Basically, the Funkadactyls, but less successful, less memorable, and with a far shorter run. Flash Funk himself was also a wasted opportunity. Number 202, Mama Benjamin. Shelton Benjamin had the raw ability and potential to be a generational talent, gaining fan support after impressive displays and surprise wins over the likes of Triple H and Ric Flair. Then WWE said he needs a personality, damn it, and had Shelton's mum badger him to tidy his room and wash his bum. It nearly tanked his career. Number 201, Crystal. Although more famous for watching Teddy Long have a heart attack at their wedding because he took too much Viagra, wrestling is the best, isn't it? Crystal, for a split second, was linked with The Miz, accompanying the future A-lister as they feuded against Layla and the Boogeyman. Yes, all that actually happened. Number 200, Mr. Hughes. Before Triple H had China, he had Mr. Hughes, a big scowling fella dressed like a member of the Ant Hill mob. But after being written off for medical reasons, Triple H found China and Hughes was quickly forgotten. Two years later, Hughes came back at Chris Jericho's side, but he was no Ralphus, and so again he buggered off. Number 199, Akio and Sakoda. With the villainous Tajiri looking to hold on to his cruiserweight championship by any means, he brought in the black-suited Akio and Sakoda to watch his back, with the three-dubbed Kyo Dai a not-so-subtle allusion to the Yakuza. Then, seemingly as soon as the angle was developed, it was dropped, with Tajiri reportedly requesting the end of the story as to not upset the actual Yakuza. Number 198, Mae Young. The legendary Mae Young was a constant presence during the Attitude Era, usually doing mad sex stuff, to be honest. It was odd. Naturally, when Exhibitionist the Cat needed backup, Mae stepped in, cornering Cat against Terry Runnels and Fabulous Moolah at WrestleMania 2000. Terry won, and May snogged Val Venus. Number 197, The Blue Meanie. It's mad to think that WWE took one look at ECW's Blue Meanie and went, sign him, sign him now! But wrestling was a hot commodity back in the late 90s, and any potential talent had to be brought in to stave off the competition. As for Meany, he feuded with Goldust, then accompanied him and called him Mummy, then hung around Stevie Richards before he bounced back to ECW. Number 196, Gail Kim. Remember Daniel Bryan's on-screen girlfriend? No, not Brie Bella. No, not Nikki Bella either. Or AJ Lee. Why, yes, it was Gail Kim. Got it right first time there, well done. Gail hitched herself to Bryan in 2011, mainly to get under the Bella's skin. The union was brief and ultimately forgettable. Number 195, Baron Von Raschke. One of the fiercest heels of the 1970s, the great Baron Von Raschke was brought into WWE as a manager for a short run in 1988, but as a face. Managing the powers of pain, the Baron quietly left after a few appearances, with the powers subsequently turning heel and enlisting Mr. Fuji. Number 194, Francine. Arguably the greatest valet in ECW history, it's often forgotten that the Queen of Extreme Francine was also in WWE CW for about two minutes. Cornering Balls Mahoney because literally nobody else needed a manager, Francine beefed with Kevin Thorne and Ariel had precisely one catfight and then promptly left. Number 193, Trinity. When WWE CW was still trying to pander to ECW fans, they resurrected the FBI and paired Little Guido, Big Guido, and Tony Mamaluke with Trinity. Unfortunately, Trinity soon blew her knees out after a moonsault, missed a chunk of time, and was taken off TV after a few months. She did win the first ever ECW Diva Halloween costume contest, though. Number 192, Sakamoto. After successfully rebuilding his career in Japan as Giant Bernard, WWE brought Albert back, renamed him Lord Tensai, and had Sakamoto follow him about to slap his opponents. Eventually, Tensai went on a losing streak and decided to take his frustrations out on Sakamoto, beating him down so hard that he landed in NXT. Number 191, Abu and Babu. Before Sakamoto, there were Abu and Babu, personal man 
manservants to Tiger Ali Singh in 1998. Like Sakamoto, the pair were just gormless lackeys there to get slapped about and beaten up. While Stabu only appeared once or twice, it was Babu who had the longer run, but they both made a tremendous impact to pro wrestling in helping Singh degrade Americans by necking them with a mouthful of tuna or by getting them to lick his utterly rancid feet. Number 190, The Caddy When Chavo Guerrero traded his lowrider for a golf cart and became Wasp Kevin White, he enlisted baby-faced Nick Nemeth to act as his caddy. The gimmick was cut short due to the untimely death of Chavo's Uncle Eddie, and Nemeth bounced back as a male cheerleader before peroxiding his hair and becoming the show-off Dolph Ziggler. Number 189, Ryan Shamrock Supposedly the younger sister of Ken, Ryan Shamrock was the pawn in a feud between her overprotective brother and Val Venus, who had made a blue movie with Shamrock Jr. called Saving Ryan's Privates. Eventually, Venus told her to hit the brick, so she managed gold dust, was nearly sacrificed by The Undertaker, co-founded Pretty Mean Sisters, then left WWE. A lot achieved in just six months, eh? Number 188, Reginald To our knowledge, the only sommelier in WWE history, Reginald followed Carmella about to make sure she had wine at all times and also to help her annoy Sasha Banks. The pairing didn't last long because WWE went, put the flippy man who does flips into the 24-7 division, and that was that. Number 187, Billy Kay After going undrafted in 2020, Billy Kay made her way to SmackDown, where she fruitlessly offered out resumes before muscling her way into the Riot Squad. For all the best effort in the world, Kay was a hindrance and cost the Riot several matches before ditching them for Carmella and subsequently receiving her WWE release. Number 186, Maria Kanellis. Whilst Maria had the greatest, greatest love with Mike Kanellis, her efforts leading him to victory were, well, crap. For a start, Maria quickly left to have a baby, and then, when she returned, the Canellises were severely de-pushed. That said, was still better than when Maria hung around with Santino and was shamed for posing for Playboy. Number 185, Coach For a split second in 1991, Mr. Perfect and the Beverly Brothers were accompanied by Coach, the Golden Greek John Tolos as a typical sports coach. We're talking cap, whistle, the lot. However, Coach didn't fit either act particularly well, and after Perfect took time off due to injury, Coach was quietly taken off of TV, with the Beverly shacking up with the genius instead. Number 184, The Honky Tonk Man With Billy Gunn floundering following the end of the smoking guns, the Honky Tonk Man stepped in, turned Gunn into Rocker Billy, and guided him down the path to superstardom. Except he didn't. The gimmick sucked, Honky Tonk hated it, and Gunn would continue to flounder until ditching Honky and forming the New Age Outlaws with Jesse James. Number 183, Jesus Carlito desperately wanted to keep the US title around his cool waist, so enlisted Jesus to watch his back, a man who took the calm, logical step of protecting Carlito's title by stabbing his rival John Cena in a nightclub. You don't F with the Jesus after all. It was all for now, to Cena soon won the title, then dispatched Jesus at Armageddon 2004. Number 182, Tiffany The last ever ECW general manager, Tiffany soon made her way over to SmackDown when ECW was sent to the bingo hall in the sky. Quietly forming the blonde tourage with Kelly Kelly, Tiffany would tag with KK on occasion, but predominantly served as a ringside equalizer until she was suspended a few months into her run and was later released. Number 181, Luther Reigns. Coming in as Kurt Angle's assistant, Luther Reigns assisted Angle in everyday tasks such as rotor management, stock taking, and battering the big show. Soon, Reigns was joined by Mark Jindrak, who attempted to form a new team Angle, but it was rubbish and they got routinely leathered by The Undertaker. Years later, Luther's son Roman would take WWE by storm. Shut up. Number 180, Tyson Kidd Although Natalia often provided managerial services for husband Tyson Kidd and whomever he was tagging with that week, Tyson would also corner Natalia from time to time. To be honest, Kidd was useless and was in comedy airhead mode, more interested in taking selfies than trying to help Natty on to victory. Number 179, Victoria After a dominant few years at the top of WWE's women's division, Victoria settled into an enforced 
also rolled for Vince's Devils Tori Wilson and Candice Michelle as they bullied Ashley Mazzaro because this was mid-2000s WWE and women's feuds were written as if they were in High School Musical. Eventually, Victoria took over most of the group's in-ring work because she was easily the best worker of the three. Number 178, Kelly Kelly. Kelly Kelly was WWE ECW's exhibitionist who loved getting her clothes off and looking awkward. However, boyfriend Mike Knox was having none of it, covering Kelly up and forcing her to accompany him ringside so that he could keep an eye on her. Yeah, this wasn't very nice or particularly good and ended when Knox hit poor Kelly with his finisher. Free the nipple, Mike, you bore! Number 177, Max Dupree. Despite being over in NXT, WWE clearly thought LA Knight was too old to wrestle, so turned the charismatic former Impact World Champion into Max Dupree, head of Maximum Male Models. Hmm. Before long, Dupree was canned due to the age-old problem of rubbing people up the wrong way, came back a week later, then became LA Knight again after Triple H took over WWE Creative. Yeah! Number 176, Maxine Dupree. With the Max Dupree experiment in trouble as soon as it began, WWE tried to salvage the MMM angle by bringing in Max's sister Maxine to run the show. It may be a bit of fun, but the gimmick doesn't really have legs and will likely never get past the bottom of the card. Though I would be happy to be proven wrong. Number 175, Shawn Michaels. HBK couldn't shake the wrestling bug after his 1998 in-ring retirement and was coaxed back by Kevin Nash in 2002 to join the NWO. Sean got to work by trimming the fat, but the group disintegrated faster than HBK's hairline, and Michaels instead went on the best run of his career. Number 174, Alicia Fox. After ditching the wedding planning industry, Alicia Fox made her way to ECW and managed DJ Gabriel in a run that lasted as long as the rest of this sentence. After several years with no direction, Fox ended up with Cedric Alexander as part of a love triangle scenario with Noam Dar on 205 Live and occasionally on Raw. Number 173, Ariel. Voluptuous vampiric vixen Ariel was an undead tarot reader who accompanied fellow vampire Kevin Thorne in WWE CW. That's right, Kevin the Vampire. The highlight of their run was a WrestleMania 23 showcase with the new breed against the far more popular ECW Originals. The Legends won, and Ariel was soon gone from the company. Number 172, Camacho. When Sin Cara 2 unmasked and became a walking stereotype, he enlisted Camacho as his low-rider bike-riding muscle. The duo didn't win much, were sent to NXT where they lost some more before Camacho was released and eventually made his way to Bullet Club as Tank. Angeloa. Wise move. Number 171, Nicole Bass. Realizing that they had struck gold with China, WWE signed six foot two inch bodybuilder Nicole Bass as Sable's bodyguard in 1999, hoping that lightning would strike twice. However, Bass wasn't very good. She would interfere in a terrible women's title match at WrestleMania 15, then briefly hung around Val Venus before her inevitable departure. Number 170, JoJo. Although best known for her ring announcing work, JoJo was briefly part of the women's division as part of a Total Divas vs AJ Lee and her mates feud in 2013. JoJo spent a few weeks accompanying her Total Divas pals ringside, then got a pin over to Mina before being sent to NXT. Number 169, Titus O'Neil. After making millions of dollars during his time in the primetime players, Titus O'Neil slipped into a management role by taking the floundering Apollo Crews and Akira Tozawa under his wing as the Titus brand, a aka Titus Worldwide. Eventually, Titus got the wrestling bug back, Tazawa wandered off, and Dana Brooke took over management duties instead. Hoorah, hoorah, hoorah! Number 168, Eva Marie. All Red Everything returned to WWE in 2021 to little enthusiasm, introduced Piper Niven to the main roster audience, and renamed her Dewdrop, because why not? Eva did little to advance Dewdrop's career by taking all of the glory for herself, with Dewdrop turning on Eva after just two months. I mean, Eva Marie was still a better manager than she was a wrestler, though. Number 167, Shinja. Ah, the mysterious Hakushi, with his unusual body paint and love of pulling Bret Hart's decapitated head out of a 
bag. For a while, he had a follower called Shinja, aka Akio of the Orient Express, but dressed like a rubbish ghost magician cosplaying as Pavarotti. That's about it, really. Number 166, Amy Weber. The image consultant for JBL's cabinet during Big John's WWE title run, Amy Weber feuded with Joy Giovanni until she was fired from the cabinet after accidentally tranquilizing JBL whilst farting about with an inflatable Godzilla. Weber soon left WWE, citing harassment from some high ranking members of the male locker room as a major contributor to her exit. Number 165, Joy Giovanni. With Amy Weber backing up the villainous cabinet, Cabinet, Joy Giovanni was drafted in to back up massive lovely lummox The Big Show. The two stood side by side against JBL and crew, eventually becoming an on-screen item, ah, before Joy was kidnapped by Kurt Angle. Oh. Number 164, Michelle McCool. Before she was the all-dominant champion of the women's division, Michelle McCool was loving life as the all-American diva, where she hung around ringside for Chuck Palumbo matches and got hit on by geeks. Seems like she always had a thing for tall boys who ride motorcycles. McCool's managerial career would only get better when she became co-mentor to Caval in NXT. And let's not forget the teacher's pets Casey, James and Idol Stevens. Or forget them if you want. Your call. Number 160. Tiger Ali Singh After routinely humiliating cash-strapped Americans, Tiger Ali Singh instead hitched his wagon to Lowdown and gave D'Lo Brown and Chaz some wonderful turbans and terrible career advice. In fact, the only memorable thing they did was lose their spot in the 2001 Royal Rumble to comedian Drew Carey. Rubbish. Number 162, The Iron Sheik. If you needed someone's back broken, wanted them to be humbled, and hated Hulk Hogan, then The Iron Sheik was the man you needed in your squad. The former WWE champion dipped one curled toe into the managerial scene as Colonel Mustafa at the side of WWE champion Sergeant Slaughter, but would not fully embrace his managerial side until teaming up with Bob Backlund to corner the Sultan in 1996 and a brief spell at Tiger Alley Singh in 1997. Number 161, Jonathan Coachman. Everyone's favorite WWE commentator, Jonathan Coachman, started palling up with Heat co announcer Al Snow in the early 2000s and accompanied the former ECW nut job for several matches. Coachman also cornered a young Garrison Cade for a bit, although why either man agreed to Coachman's help is anyone's guess. I suppose he wasn't a very good coach, man. <laughs> why are you booing me? Number 100. 160 PG-13 USWA's Wolfie D and JC Ice were inducted into the Nation of Domination during the group's early run, where the lads rapped and bounced about like rabbits on amphetamines. After several months, Farouk had had enough and expelled PG-13 from the group. Frankly, we can't blame him. Number 159, Reverend Devon. After the Dudleys were split in the inaugural WWE draft, Devon became a reverend, an actual reverend. Instead of leading prayer or hymns, he largely stood looking mean with Deacon Batista, but never managed the brute to any real success. Number 158, Deacon Batista. Deacon Batista was the difference maker of the pairing, smacking Devon's opponents about and being all massive in that. The pairing didn't last long because the gimmick was pants, and WWE went, oh, hang on, that's Batista, and pushed him to the moon because it's Batista. Number 157, Jim Ross. Vince McMahon has a fetish for trying to get Jim Ross booed and humiliated on TV. First, he had Jim bring fake Diesel and Razor Ramon to WWE, then after that bombed, he had him bring in Dr. Death Steve Williams before going, I give up, and letting Ross just announce, you know, that thing he's really good at. Bad guard. Number 156, Emma. Santino Morella plucked Emma from obscurity slash NXT in order to dance around with him in the face of fellow dancers Fandango and Summer Rae. Pro wrestling. The pair had decent chemistry, but the union didn't last long as Santino decided to retire a few months into the run. Number 155, David Otunga. Long after the Nexus had died with a whimper, David Otunga recalled that he is a qualified lawyer and set about being the new Clarence Mason, assisting Alberto Del Rio in trying to get Sheamus' bro kick banned ahead of their world title clash at Night of Champions 2012. With Otunga by his side, Del Rio lost. 
to a bro kick. Number 154, Katie Lee Birchill. The hands-on sister of Paul Birchill, Katie Lee Birchill was found at the pirate side when she wasn't competing in the Divas division. As a twosome, Katie Lee and Paul achieved next to nothing, with Katie Lee unable to save Paul's job in a mask versus career match against the Hurricane on ECW. Number 153, Jacqueline. Originally earmarked for a valet run with Jeff Jarrett, WWE would wait until Mark Merrow needed help in his spat with Sable before Jacqueline established her presence. Despite going on to great managerial success in TNA, Jacqueline did little from the sidelines in WWE, mainly wrestling alongside Mero before later forming PMS as a vehicle for meets of all wrestlers. Oh, and she would also hang out with the APA too, for a laugh. Number 152, JBL. The nicest, most humble man in professional wrestling, JBL shocked everyone when he returned to WWE in 2022 as a big, mean hero. Heel. Reintroducing Baron Corbin to Raw, the pairing of Jibble and Corbel generated little heat before JBL gave up on Corbin and apparently Triple H did too. Number 151, Yamaguchi-san. Long before they were evil, Kai and Tai were an unruly Japanese street gang under the watchful eye of Yamaguchi-san. Val Venus, being a silly tit, decided to have a bit of how's your father with Mrs. Yamaguchi, prompting Yamaguchi-san to try and castrate him with a sword. A memorable highlight of a brief run. Number 150, Dana Brooke. When Emma made a permanent jump from NXT to main roster, she brought Dana Brooke along for the ride. Then, after Emma got injured, Charlotte took Dana as backup, where Brooke got beat a lot until Charlotte fired her. Finding some glasses and a clipboard, Dana then became chief analyst for Titus Worldwide, but few cared. Number 149, The Hose. Okay, so whilst the women portraying the Godfather's employees may have been different week in, week out, the hoes were a constant throughout the Attitude Era and got Godfather massively over. Ringside, all they did was dance and grind with Tim White, whilst one hoe won the hardcore title for 15 whole seconds. The gimmick's aged badly, hasn't it? Number 148, Uncle Cletus. Pig Farmers the Godwins went all mean in 1997, kicked Hillbilly Jim to the curb and brought in their Uncle Cletus to manage them. Uncle Cletus was former lavatory enthusiast T.L. Hopper, and after a few weeks and a two-day title run, the Godwins battered him and sent him back to the farm. Number 147, Cameron. Remember the Funkadactyls? They were like the Funkettes, but from the Jurassic period. Serving as Brodus Clay's personal backup dancers, the Funkadactyls were popular, but did not nothing but dance. Out of the two, Cameron is the least remembered, partly owing to the fact that Naomi is, well, Naomi. Number 146, Dominic Mysterio. Eddie Guerrero's biological son made his debut as a tiny upset child, but would wait another 14 years to properly get involved with the Graps, accompanying dad, Rey Mysterio, in 2019. Safe to say, Dominic was ineffective. He was just kind of there getting slapped about until eventually becoming a wrestler in his own right. Number 145, The Jackal. Part David Koresh, part Howard Stern, The Jackal was certainly ahead of his time in WWE, with Don Callis' cult leader character an eye-opening early Attitude Era act. Despite the gimmick being kinda interesting, Jackal just hung about with the Truth Commission and the Oddities, neither world-beating stables. He also managed the Acolytes for about 10 seconds before being quietly released and going to ECW. Number 144, Sid. Steaming softball psycho Sid returned to WWE in 1995 and became Shawn Michaels' new bodyguard as HBK went after WWE Champion Diesel at WrestleMania 11. At Mania, Sid did bugger all but get cheered just for being Sid, then turned on Michaels the following night by awkwardly powerbombing him a lot. Number 143, Bruno Sammartino. The living legend called it a day in the early 80s and decided that he would give the rub to son David by being in his corner at WrestleMania. Bruno's shadow loomed large, David wasn't very good, and the fans popped more for his dad. Indeed, just one year later, David was out the company as Bruno competed at WrestleMania 2. Number 142, Roddy Piper. Originally hired as a manager to David Schultz and Paul Orndorff in 1984, WWE instead turned Roddy Piper into one of the biggest stars of the era. You know, because it's Roddy sodding Piper. 
In 2003, Piper came back and was given the task of watching over Sean O'Hare. Unfortunately, the pairing did nothing for either man and may have even hurt O'Hare as Piper was fired during their brief alliance. But hey, we're not telling you anything you didn't already know. Number 141, Linda McMahon. Although usually resigned to WWE boardroom matters or being catatonic in a wheelchair, Linda McMahon has been known to get involved with the Graps from time to time. For example, the time Linda managed Mick Foley in the main event of WrestleMania 2000, although Foley lost and it was all merely an excuse for McMahon family drama, trademark. Linda was also ringside for Shane McMahon's triumph over Vince at Mania X7, but to be fair, she was in a vegetative state for most of the contest before taking a penalty with Vince's infamous infamous grapefruits. Number 140, Bob Backlund. Mad as a chicken's ass, former WWE champion Bob Backlund was brought back in an effort to make Darren Young great again in 2016. The pair didn't gel, fans were apathetic, and then Young got injured and released whilst Backlund went home to do some headstands and admire his bow tie collection. Bob also managed the Sultan in 1996. Remember that? Number 139, B Squared. When John Cena became a naughty little rapping thug, he needed someone to watch his back, so Bill Buchanan obliged, grabbed a tiny beanie hat, and changed his name to B Squared. Whilst he is a cult hero amongst wrestling fans, B Squared didn't last long before being kicked to the curb in favor of Red Dog. Booyah! Number 138, Summer Rae. Summer Rae just couldn't pick him. Starting off as Fandango's dance partner until she was sacked via Twitter, Summer Rae then hitched her wagon to Rusev until he got engaged to Lana. With one last roll of the dice, she accompanied Tyler Breeze, but main roster Tyler Breeze and not the NXT workhorse. Tough break. Number 137, Christy Hemi. The least memorable member of the Legion of Doom this side of Rocco, Christy Hemi cornered the tag team champions Animal and Heidenreich, Jesus, as they tussled with Eminem. Hemi was solely there to brawl with Melina, and LOD lost the titles during their brief alliance. The right call. Still, for Hemi, this was better than managing Eugene. Number 136, Abraham Washington. A loudmouthed, obnoxious sports agent, Abraham Washington would stand at ringside with a live mic shouting instructions and insults, garnering some good old heat. Washington first managed Primo and Epico before getting rid for the far superior primetime players. That is, until he made a controversial joke about Kobe Bryant, then angered the McMahons and was released from WWE. Number 135, Tennessee Lee. Remember Colonel Robert Parker from WCW? Well, he's back in WWE. WWE form. Veteran Robert Fuller brought his gimmick over to the Fed in 1998, renamed himself Tennessee Lee, and watched over Jeff Jarrett for a few months before Double J kicked him to the curb for being a bit rubbish. Number 134, Bam Neely. Named after NHL legend Cam Neely, aka Seabass in Dumb and Dumber, Bam Neely was the generic looking muscle for La Familia in 2007, mainly protecting Chavo Guerrero in ECW. To be fair, Neely, like most of La Familia, was just there to get battered by the the Undertaker and cost Chavo as many matches as he helped him win. Number 133, Sweet Sapphire. Sapphire bloody loved Dusty Rhodes and was seated ringside at several WWE events going mad for the American dream. Dusty was a lovely lad, so said, Heck, you can be my manager, and Sweet Sapphire started accompanying Dream bedecked in polka dots. Sapphire excelled at bopping Sensational Sherry with her bottom and dancing, also mainly with her bottom. Number 132, Naomi. After Funkadactyling with Cameron and Brodus Clay, Naomi split off to make a name for herself in WWE's women's division, but would still offer her managerial services from time to time. Okay, so Naomi mostly hung around with the Usos because husband Jimmy Uso needed backup, and before she walked out of WWE, many of us were expecting Naomi to join the bloodline. Guess Sami Zayn would have to do instead. Number 131, Brodus Clay. Alberto Del Rio enlisted Brodus Clay to watch his back heading into WrestleMania 27, with Del Rio looking to defeat Edge for the World Heavyweight Championship. He lost. Take two. Brodus would surely help Del Rio defeat Christian in a ladder match for the vacant title at Extreme Rules, wouldn't he? Again, no. Sadly, there would be no take three as Brodus left Del Rio to become a dinosaur. 
Number 130, the Bella Twins. Like popular video game Mario Twins, the Bellas look the same, and before spearheading WWE's Divas division, they seemed to just sort of bounce from storyline to storyline, where the punchline was Twins Basil. For example, they managed Daniel Bryan because they both fancied him. Such larks. However, they rarely interfered in Dee Bryan's matches and were just there to scrap with Gail Kim. Number 129, Hiroko. The geisha valet of husband Kenzo Suzuki, Hiroko proudly wanted the crowd to cheer Kenzo onto the victory to mixed reactions. Something must have worked though, as Kenzo and Rene Dupree ended up winning the WWE Tag Team titles, and Kenzo even challenged John Cena for the US title before the pair were released. Number 128, Jerry Lawler. During Jerry Lawler and Bret Hart's never-ending feud in the new generation, Lawler brought in the ultimate opponent to put Hart in his place. His dentist. Isaac Yankum, DDS. I, Yankum, comedy gold. With Lawler by his side, there was no way this actual dentist could lose against the greatest wrestler of a generation. But he did, time and time again. Obviously. Number 127, The Wizard. No, not the Grand Wizard, but King Curtis Iakea, long before all that Dungeon of Doom nonsense. Wiz cornered Kamala and Seeker in 1986, cutting amazing promos whilst allegedly under the influence of LSD, and even took Kamala to the WWE title scene before selling his contract to Mr. Fuji after a quick run. Number 126, Kimchi. Despite having various managers during his time in WWE, Kamala was so wild that he also needed big burly handler Kimchi to make sure he didn't fly off the handle. In reality, it was just the Brooklyn Brawler in a safari suit. Kim Kimchi stuck by Kamala until being sacked in 1993 for treating the Ugandan giant badly. Number 125, Matt Stryker. After getting on the boogeyman's tits, Matt Stryker threw his weight behind Big Daddy V to guide the big fella to domination whilst also having a literal beast to protect him. Unfortunately, this was during WWE CW's darkest days and no one cared, even if Stryker did manage to guide Daddy V to victory over Extreme Kane. Number 124, Rick Boogs. Damn it, I want a hunky guitar boy on main, screamed Vince McMahon. But we have Elias, replied Brucey e. P. Elias, shave him, call him Ezekiel, get me a different guitar boy, replied Vince. Step forward, Rick Boogs, the cult NXT favorite who could shred with the best of them. Playing Shinsuke Nakamura to the ring on SmackDown, Boogs got over, then teamed with Nakamura instead until he went down with injury at WrestleMania 38. Number 123, Molly Holly. The third Holly cousin and former Miss Madness 1999, Molly came in to side with, well, the Hollies before leaving them to hang around with boyfriend Spike Dudley. Both pairings were good but never really went anywhere, so Molly ditched Dudley. WWE for the Alliance, then joined Shane Helms and became Mighty Molly, although she was a far better wrestler than she was a manager. Number 122, The Mean Street Posse. Hapless silver spoon idiots Pete Gass, Joey Abs, and Rodney were Shane McMahon's boys from the mean streets of Greenwich, Connecticut. The posse had Shane O'Max, Shane O'Back during the corporation years, helping him defend his European title whilst they themselves got battered week in, week out. Number 121, Serena. Despite being a wrestling professor, Serena was relegated to hanger-on status during the days of CM Punk's Straight Edge Society. Punk got a few wins, sure, but Gallows and Mercury, not so much. The group should have accomplished more, and Serena was unfortunately fired during this run for not living the gimmick. Brother! Number 120, Commander Aziz. After hanging round looking mean in Raw Underground, Dabba Kato quickly rose the ranks of the Nigerian army to become Commander Aziz, right-hand man of Apollo Crews. The commander did help Apollo win the Intercontinental Championship at WrestleMania 37, but after Apollo dropped the title, the act was all but forgotten about, with both men sent separately to NXT. Number 119, Tori Wilson. What links Billy Gunn, Jimmy Wang Yang, Carlito, Tajiri, and Ric Flair? That's right, they were all at one time accompanied by Tori Wilson in WWE. Tori was very popular during her run, but to be honest, she didn't really enhance many of the above, especially Ric Flair, despite the obvious fact that charisma vacuum, no personality, shy retiring Flair badly needed a manager. 
That was clearly a joke, by the way. Tori was over, mind you, and really didn't need to do much of anything in WWE to be popular. Teenagers fancied the pants off her, didn't they? And to be fair, the Tajiri run was a bit of fun. Number 118, Ivory. Long before becoming a puritanical bore with right to censor, Ivory was fun and could often be found at the side of a post-nation Mark Henry and D'Lo Brown. However, as one of the only women on the roster at the time who could actually wrestle, Ivory embarked on a successful heel run, then after a handful of championship reigns, joined the alliance to corner another renowned party animal. Lance Storm. Number 117, Superstar Billy Graham. Iconic, often imitated, former WWWF champion Billy Graham was a bit knackered by 1987, and after being written out of active competition, Graham provided managerial services to none other than The Rock. Don Morocco. Don The Rock Morocco. Graham guided Morocco to the quarterfinals of the WrestleMania IV WWE title tournament, where Big Don lost to Ted DiBiase. Superstar then quietly shuffled over to commentary instead. Number 116, Theodore Long. Long before all the holla holla hollas, tag matches, and going one on one with The Undertaker, Teddy Long was the nefarious Theodore Long who urged people to get down with De Brown and manage the likes of D'Lo Brown, Jazz, Chris Nowinski, and Mark Henry, amongst others. A far cry from his success as a manager in WCW, Theodore just acted the bollocks until he became SmackDown GM. He was very entertaining in the role, though. I mean, who didn't want to back to Mac? Long would later have a heart attack on his wedding night due to too much Viagra. Hero. Number 115, Brother Love. Sweaty, red, annoying televangelist Brother Love's primary role was as an antagonistic talk show host during his WWE run in the late 80s to early 90s, but he importantly did manage one client, The Undertaker. Famously unleashing the dead man at Survivor Series 1990, Brother Love would stay at the dead man's side for a few months before selling his contract to Paul Bearer. Whilst it was not a great fit stylistically, it was iconic, but that's 100% due to how Undy's career panned out after leaving Love in the dust. Love would dust off his managerial license in the Attitude Era to corner the Sisters of Love, but they quickly ditched him and became the headbangers instead. Number 114, Eve Torres. Now, I'm not saying Eve was a bad manager, but when she is most remembered for a wheelchaired up Zack Ryder being turned into street pizza, then she certainly can't rank as great. Before breaking Zack's heart, and let's be honest, his WWE career too, Eve also accompanied Crime Time, Kelly Kelly, and R-Truth. But at the end of the day, it all comes back to Broski's teary face as he watched Eve snog John Cena before getting pummeled by Kane. Number 113, Paige. After her untimely and fortunately temporary retirement due to injury, Paige was granted her manager's license and brought Asuka and Kairi Sane together as the Kabuki Warriors. The whole unit looked like a surefire hit, with Paige doing the majority of the promo work whilst Asuka and Sane mowed through everyone in front of them. However, the team didn't actually taste any real success until Paige took time off TV to undergo neck surgery. When Paige returned, the Kabuki Warriors promptly kicked her to the curb. Number 112, Ezekiel Jackson. The stoic, well-read advisor to THE Brian Kendrick, Big Zeke stood around looking hard until WWE stopped pushing Kendrick because small and started pushing Jackson because big. Jackson technically managed Kendrick to the WWE title, although it was during a scramble match so didn't count as a reign and Jackson wasn't ringside. The streets remember, though. Number 111, Shannon Moore. The least remembered member of WCW's Three Count put some respect on Evan Courageous's name, thank you. Shannon Moore ditched the pop star life to become an official MF'er when he started following best mate Matt Hardy version 1. As Hardy's number one lackey, Moore helped V1 win the Cruiserweight title at No Way Out 2003, but often took a beating from Hardy whenever he displeased him. I mean, you would, wouldn't you? It's Shannon Moore. Number 110, El Torito. When Primo and Epico decided to become matadors, they needed a bull to accompany them. Despite the lads being from Puerto Rico, roughly 4,000 miles away from Spain, and despite matadors and bulls being natural enemies. Regardless, Los Matadores unleashed El Torito on the world. A small man bull thing, El Torito was a bit like the Minotaur, but less terrifying. You could argue that El Torito was a mascot, but whatever, I make the rules. 
Torito hung around ringside, helped Los Matadores win from time to time, and that was about it. Oh, and let's not forget WLC, it was a classic. Number 109, Eric Bischoff. Whilst karate obsessed NWO mastermind Eric Bischoff did his best managerial work in WCW, Eazy E did throw his weight behind certain superstars during his time as Raw General Manager. Memorably, Bischoff masterminded Three Minute Warning, with Rosie and Jamal battering whichever jobbers Bischoff didn't like at that present moment in time. Can't say Bisch did much for their careers from a win loss standpoint, though. Bischoff also briefly managed Chris Jericho, but this was solely because Bischoff hated John Cena and Evil Eric made sure Jericho was removed from WWE when he didn't beat Big Match John. At least he didn't fire him via FedEx. Number 108, Southern Justice. Jeff Jarrett had a lot of enemies in 1998, and despite Tennessee Lee managing his affairs, he needed some good old boys to watch his back. Enter Southern Justice, aka former Godwins Dennis Knight and Mark Canterbury. A bit like Elvis Presley's infamous Memphis Mafia, Southern Justice provided security for Jarrett for a few months until Canterbury retired due to injury and Knight found Satan and discovered a love for public nudity as we all invariably do. Number 107, Diana Hart. Although best remembered for scowling her way through SummerSlam 92's main event, Diana Hart played a quiet but important role as Mrs. Calgary Stampede in the mid-90s. Before this, Diana would levy serious allegations at Shawn Michaels and would stand behind husband Davey Boy Smith as he looked to lamp the Heartbreak Kid. Then, when the Hart Foundation reformed to wage war on Steve Austin, Diana was once again in the fold, accompanying the team in the main event of the Herald Canadian Stampede as all hell broke loose. Let's be honest, Diana didn't do much, but she was ever present during one of the hottest feuds of the time. Number 106, Oscar. Men on a Mission's hype man Oscar was a beam of positivity and rap bars with such Grammy-worthy lines as, his name's Mo and his name's not Joe. Factual and entertaining, just like me. After two fruitless years as a trio, aside from MOM accidentally winning the tag team titles at a European house show because Mabel legitimately flattened a Quebecer, Mabel and Moe turned heel on the hapless Oscar and sent him on his way. Number 105, Sir Moe. Sir Moe was better at handling Mabel's affairs than Oscar was, but that's not saying much, really. Knighted by 1995 King of the Ring winner Mabel, still weird to say, men on a mission were the big baddies of WWE for several months, with Moe carrying out Mabel's dirty work from ringside. Eventually, Mabel injured several people of influence, you know, people like The Undertaker and WWE Champion Diesel, and unsurprisingly, the duo were quietly pushed down the card and out the door. Number 104, Ashley. When cheeky hooligans Paul London and Brian Kendrick were feuding with Idol Stevens and Casey James, they needed someone to counteract the scheming Michelle McCool, who was meddling on Stevens and James's behalf. Step forward, Ashley, part Playboy Bunny, part Avril Lavigne, all attitude. The trio were fairly popular on SmackDown, with Ashley continuing to cheer Lundrick on as they held the tag titles for over 300 days before dropping the belts and quietly fizzling out. Number 103, Oliver Humperdinck. After Bam Bam Bigelow's arrival in WWE in 1987, every manager in the company vied for his services, but Bigelow only wanted Oliver Humperdinck handling his affairs. Humperdinck later picked up Paul Orndorff as a client and was one of the few face managers in WWE during the height of managers in the company, a role that Humperdinck allegedly disliked. His run in the Fed wasn't long, and Humperdinck soon left the company, going to Jim Crockett Promotions at Bigelow's side once more. Number 102, Frenchy Martin. Proud son of Quebec, Dino Bravo, enlisted equally proud son of Quebec, Frenchy Martin, to help draw sublime heat from the US crowds, mainly by holding a small placard that said, USA is not okay. How are Canadians still polite when attempting to be rude? Frenchie helped Bravo swindle and bamboozle numerous opponents, but was pretty useless on the big stage, with Bravo losing most of his pay-per-view matches, aside from a quick win over secret proud son of Quebec, Ronnie Garvin. 
Babyfaces not named Bret Hart aren't allowed to be proudly Canadian, remember? Number 101, Tory. Before you had Nikki and Trish, you had Tory and Sable, with Tory the number one fan of the 38 special. Tory would help Sable retain her women's championship on several occasions, but the two would soon fall out and fight, as is tradition. Several months later, Tory would decide that she was attracted to Kane, mask and all, but would soon ditch the massive lummox to shack up with X Pac and become the least remembered member of D Generation X. Whilst in DX, Tori did help Stephanie McMahon win the women's title, which was nice of her, I suppose. Number 100, Rosa Mendez. After leading Zack Ryder on a tear through ECW, including a WWE career-ending win over Tommy Dreamer, Rosa Mendez would bounce around WWE until becoming Primo and Epico's manager in late 2011. The trio quickly tasted success, with Mendez cornering the future Matadors as they defeated Air Boom for the WWE Tag Team titles, holding them through WrestleMania 28. However, Mendez couldn't have been doing too great of a job, as the titles were largely forgotten when it came to pay-per-view main cards leading to Abraham Washington taking the reins of the team as Rosa just stood there smiling on the outside but fuming on the inside. Mendez would later accompany Adam Rose and Fandango. Number 99, Miss Kitty. Intercontinental champion Jeff Jarrett decided that his manager Deborah needed an assistant, and wouldn't you just know it, Miss Kitty was hanging around looking for a job. Kitty eventually took over most of Deborah's duties until Jarrett lost the title and left WWE. After Jeff, Kitty decided that she would manage China, even though China didn't need her, despite Kitty wearing a little black wig and dressing like a mini ninth wonder of the world. Aww. Eventually, Kitty, sorry, the cat, fell foul of the right to censor due to her fondness of getting her kitties out and started managing her chivalrous real-life husband, Jerry Lawler. The storyline was abandoned when WWE released the cat. Number 98, Shaniqua. After winning Tough Enough 2 and briefly managing Shelton Benjamin, Linda Miles was transformed into Shaniqua, a mysterious dominatrix. Naturally, the owner and operator of Sex Cauldron was the ideal choice for a pro wrestling manager and somehow led literal gimps the Bashan brothers to tag team glory in October 2003, with the brothers beating Los Guerreros for the tag straps. Yes, those Los Guerreros. The Bashams held the belts until February, and then a week after dropping the belts, Shaniqua was sent to OVW, then was subsequently released by WWE. Number 97, Demolition Axe. With time against him, and due to shellfish allergies, no, really, Axe started to step away from in-ring competition with Demolition, with Crush all but replacing him in the team. Axe was still a vital and prominent part of the crew, though, as the tag team champions used the Freebird rule for when Axe was fit enough to wrestle. But the aging star usually stuck to the sidelines, even attempting twin magic with Crush at SummerSlam 1990 to no avail before being kayfabe fired by WWE. Number 96, Cherry. In 2007, WWE somehow accessed a time machine and plucked Grease's Deuce and Domino and roller skating valet Cherry from the 1950s and set them to work on SmackDown. Initially, the team were successful, with Cherry watching on as D&D won the tag titles, holding them for several months until they dropped them to Matt Hardy and MVP. The gimmick was never going to last, though, so Cherry became a fan favorite during a bikini contest and was soon ditched by Deuce and Domino and replaced by Maurice. Number 95, Mickey James. In 2017, we were all asking just who was La Luchadora? Was it Becky Lynch, Deonna Perazzo, Officer Barbrady, or Alexa Bliss? Well, it was all of them, but also Mickey James, who unmasked after helping Alexa retain her SmackDown Women's Championship against Lynch in a steel cage. Mickey was back and hung around Alexa as the two basically took the piss out of the entire women's division, with Mickey either helping Alexa retain the title or take the pin if the two ever teamed. Eventually, Mickey booted Alexa's head off before joining back up, then splitting again before joining up again and splitting for a final time in 2019. Number 94. Tony Atlas. 
With Mark Henry inducting his first guests into the Hall of Pain on ECW, kinda, Tony Atlas decided to pop up, turn heel, and manage Henry as he destroyed the ECW roster whilst champion. With Henry finding his feet as a main event level heel for the first time in his career, Atlas was there to do the legwork, distractions, being a general nuisance, wearing a shirt and tie without sleeves, you know, the usual. Eventually, Henry dropped the title to Matt Hardy, so the pair feuded with Finley and Hornswoggle until Mark packed his bags and went to Raw, whilst Atlas hung around Abraham Washington and laughed like a moron. Number 93, Ludwig Kaiser. Acting as the German Silver Surfer to Gunther's Galactus, Ludwig Kaiser started life on Main as little more than an eloquent hype man for Der Ring General, glowering at whichever unfortunate sod was about to be served a plate of chops before eating a couple himself. Give her a few months and WWE went, Ludwig's ripped and mint in the ring, ain't he? And set him back to work, even bringing Giovanni Vinci back to reform Imperium, with Gunter clutching the Intercontinental Championship in his scary massive hands. Number 92, Gangrel. Everyone's favorite wrestling Dracula, sorry Kevin Thorne, Gangrel led his brood through two different incarnations in the Attitude Era. Whilst he served more as a partner to Edge and Christian, Gangrel was firmly pulling the strings when he lured the Hardy Boys over to the dark side, with Matt and Jeff changing their look, a look that they still have now as men in their mid-40s. Eventually, Gangrel royally screwed everything up after the Hardys won the historic tag team ladder match at No Mercy 99, claiming that he sunk his fang into Terry Runnels, earning him a drubbing from E and C and M and J. Number 91, Danny Davis. The finest wrestling referee this side of Shane Sewell, Dangerous Danny Davis was also a part-time manager, accompanying the Hart Foundation when Jimmy Hart frankly couldn't be bothered. A sniveling little weasel, Davis bent the rules to make sure Brett and Anvil escaped with the gold, but Jimmy was still the brains of the operation. Davis was still an important cog in the machine, though. Whether distracting the ref in charge of the match and claiming that he was running things or just physically reversing pins, Davis was effective in the role and became one of the most hated heels in the company. Number 90, Tyson Tomko. Another entry in the ooh, he's massive section of WWE history, Tomko was Christian's problem solver, roughing up anyone that dared step to Captain Charisma and Trish Stratus. And to be fair to him, Tomko was good at his job. He made sure that Trish kept an iron grip on the women's championship and had Christian's back as the Pete Master became massively over whilst unable to break through the glass ceiling into the main event. Couldn't give Christian a beat when he needed it though. Nobody's perfect. Eventually, Tomko went went out on his own as a monster heel, but later resumed his problem-solving services for Christian in TNA. Number 89, Paul Ellering. Whoa, 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 now before you get angry, Paul Ellering did his best work everywhere but main roster WWE. Cornering the Road Warriors through the AWA, GCP slash WCW, the NWA, and across Japan, never mind his run with the Authors of Pain in NXT, Ellering always masterminded success. WWE was a different story. Arriving in 1992 and later unleashing Rocco the Dummy on the world, Ellering was around for about 20 seconds before he and LOD left. Ellering returned in 1998, jumped to DOA, then went back to LOD, then buggered off again, having done nout. Then, after guiding AOP to dominance in NXT, they got rid of Ellering on their first night on Main. So yeah, save your comments, I'm unfortunately right. Number 88, Nidia. The co-winner of the first ever season of Tough Enough, Nidia was given the mantle of Trailer Trash Queen and Boo of Jamie Noble. Nidia would help lead Noble to Cruiserweight Championship glory, but would receive a blinding at the hands of Tajiri as a reward. Definitely got the short end of the stick there. Humble, chivalrous Noble then repeatedly used blind Nidia as a human shield to keep his mitts on the gold until Nidia found out what he was doing and kicked him out of their double wide. Number 87, Stephen Richards. Buzz killing, white sock wearing, puritanical party pooper Stephen Richards led the right to censor on a crusade towards decency in WWE. Basically, they didn't like booze, bloods, boobs, and brawling, and we're here to make everything nice and friendly. Despite being a lower mid card act, Richards led the group to success, overseeing a tag title win for Bull Buchanan and the Good Father. Then, at WrestleMania X7, the group lost all their matches, and Richards was powerbombed out of his shirt and tie by The Undertaker a few weeks later. 
her. Richards would eventually apologize for his ways and would second WWE Women's Champion Victoria. Number 86, Carmella and R-Truth. Dance break! In 2018, Carmella and R-Truth were paired up and decided to accompany each other for matches because they had nothing better to do, despite Carmella holding the SmackDown Women's title. As soon as that was whisked away by Charlotte, the fabulous Truth became a nice little distraction on WWE TV, whether teaming in mixed tag action, watching each other's backs in singles matches, or dancing and flossing and other things that sound painful coming out of my sad, tired little mouth. Eventually, the two managed one another to great success in the 20. 24-7 title division. Okay, maybe not great success. In fact, success is stretching it a bit. Let's just say they were managing each other in a wrestling environment. Number 85, Omos. Omos is massive, ain't he? But he was green as grass when he came up to WWE's main roster after starring in the critically lauded Raw Underground and after his time as a ninja. So WWE put him at the side of AJ Styles, who admittedly is quite good at wrestling. Kayfabe-wise, this partnership took Omos to new heights, unimaginable heights as the man was already literally a giant. After being the difference maker for Styles time after time after time, the pair would reign as Raw Tag Team Champions for over 130 days. But this is a managers and bodyguards list, not a tag champions list. Watch that video when you're done, kids. And Omos was hardly the second coming of Diesel now, was he? Number 84, Jillian Hall. First coming in as Eminem's fixer, Jillian Hall is best remembered for her run as JBL's image consultant, with Jovial John's publicity needing some rehab after he lost the WWE title, and because he's a bellend. Hall was successful in the role, getting JBL into the US title scene, watching from ringside as Bradshaw beat Benoit for the belt at WrestleMania 22. And that was it. Okay, fine, the boogeyman ate a giant repulsive growth off of Hall's face during JBL's feud with the clock-smashing ghoul. Happy now? Look at it. Look at it and cry. Paul was fired by JBL after accidentally smashing the short-tempered Texan with a cage door. Number 83, Bret Hart. The best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be, and a real jam-up guy. Bret Hart was also a fairly successful manager, even if his run with a manager's license is kind of forgettable. After his return in 2010 and subsequent dismantling of Vince McMahon at WrestleMania 26, Bret watched on as the Hart Dynasty defeated Show Miz for the undisputed tag titles before the Hitman defeated The Miz for the US belt. Bret would later corner his niece Natalia against women's champion Charlotte with Rick Flair at Payback 2016, but WWE just had to do the screw job, didn't they? Then, now, forever. Number 82, Layla. Despite Jamie Noble sniffing around her like a sad puppy, Layla realized that he was a loser and instead piled up with the ruthless William Regal not long after Regal's return from suspension. The pairing quickly bore fruit, with Regal once again ascending the ranks before absolutely smashing Santino Morella for the Intercontinental Championship, with Layla a vital piece of the puzzle. Unfortunately, nothing lasts forever, and not long after Regal dropped the belt to CM Punk, Layla was sent to SmackDown, where she soon formed Lay Cool, who used their vital knowledge to guide absolute rookie Caval in NXT. They low-key loved that. Number 81, Miss Jackie. After the dissolution of the world's greatest tag team, Mr. Personality Charlie Haas needed someone handling his affairs, and voila! Miss Jackie appeared. Soon, Jackie teamed Chuck with her client Rico and managed the original log couple to the WWE Tag Team titles. What a turn up for the books, eh? Miss Jackie managed the team to several successful defenses against world caliber teams like the FBI and Billy Gunn and Hardcore Holly before dropping the belts to the Dudleys. Jackie would stick by Charlie's side through a tedious love triangle angle with Dawn Marie before the pair were released in 2005, days after their real life honeymoon. Number 80, William Regal. Whilst more famous outside the ring in WWE for his commissioner and general management work than his ringside managerial work, William Regal was still a force to be reckoned with at any wrestler's side. Okay, so his turn as Paul Burchill's buxom wench was piss poor, but his work with Eugene was surprisingly effective, never mind his superb run with Tajiri. Regal's work as King Booker's town crier was also quite fun, but he never reached the managerial heights in WWE that he would later on in AEW. 
you. Number 79, James Ellsworth. Chinless pest James Ellsworth earned an unlikely legion of fans when he was manhandled by Braun Strowman, then embarked on a series of diminishing returns. After defeating AJ Styles too many times, Ellsworth went on a run with Carmella that's remembered for all the wrong reasons. Well, mainly for Ellsworth being the first ever winner of the Women's Money in the Bank ladder match. Still, from a kayfabe POV, Ellsworth and Carmella worked well together, and Ellsworth did get a huge reaction when unmasking at Money in the Bank 2018, helping Carmella defeat Asuka of all people at numerous pay-per-views. Number 78, Drake Maverick. Now, I know we said earlier that Paul Ellering in main roster WWE wasn't very good, but surely if you were AOP, you would have stuck with him rather than little managerial experience Drake Maverick. Whilst we may have rolled our eyes at the pairing, it did work out well, with Maverick guiding AOP to the Raw Tag Team titles in a handicap win over Seth Rollins after Dean Ambrose left town. Maverick did little outside of being a horrible piss-soaked little gremlin, and it was Maverick's fault AOP lost the titles after being pinned in a two-on-three handicap match against Chad Gable and Bobby Roode, where the champs had the advantage. Number 77, The Miztourage. A-list douchebag intercontinental champion Miz needed some gormless lackeys to watch his back in 2017, and there was no one more gormless or lackier than Curtis Axel and Bo Dallas. This Miztourage were your classic bumbling goof henchman team, but they were effective in the role, causing all manner of calamity as Miz successfully defended the title against the likes of Dean Ambrose and Jason Jordan before Roman Reigns took the strap for himself. Even though they were there to get heat and take a beating, the team were more effective and popular than it had any right to be, punctuated when the three defeated Jason Jordan and the bloody Hardy Boys in six-man action. Number 76, Stacey Key. The least likely member of the Dudley clan, Stacy thought Bubba and Devon seem okay and sided with the Table Twins as the Duchess of Dudleyville before they put her through a table. After brushing the splinters out of her hair, Stacy shacked up with Test, talked about testicles a lot, Test's fans that is, and also brought the calm and cuddly Scott Steiner into the fold. Unfortunately, Test and Big Popper Pump would end up using Stacy as a sex slave. Ugh. Stacy would eventually break free and become Super Stacy, cornering tag champions Hurricane and Rosie, which was a much nicer affair. Number 75, Tamina. You might think, oh yes, Tamina's run as AJ Lee's bodyguard was quite good, which it was. Then you remember the fact that because WWE had nothing meaningful for her to do for years, Tamina provided managerial services to whomever needed it. The debuting Usos, who lost a lot, Santino and Kozlov, JTG, pretty rudderless booking, but hey, a gig's a gig. However, let's focus on the positives. Tamina with AJ Lee worked very well. The classic muscle behind the cowardly weedy heel champion trope hardly ever fails, and Lee was handily the most despised heel in the women's division at the time. Number 74, Eric Rowan. Following several stints on the shelf and numerous different pushes, Eric Rowan resurfaced in 2019 as a big environmentally conscious bruiser who helped the planet's champion Daniel Bryan retain his WWE championship over AJ Styles, whilst also picking up litter and washing oil-covered seagulls and all that. After a run as SmackDown Tag Champs, Rowan would once again do Brian's dirty work, which basically boiled down to possibly hitting Roman Reigns with a car before denying it was him, then confirming it was indeed him, and attacking Brian because Brian didn't want anyone to hit Roman with a car. It was a bit of a mess, to be honest, but if you needed someone possibly hit with a car and couldn't find Rikishi, then there was no one better than Big Red. Number 73, The Fabulous Moolah. One of the most famous and controversial women's wrestling stars ever, the fabulous Moolah was a manager and valet throughout her career, accompanying the legendary Buddy Rogers in the 1950s. As Vince McMahon took WWE Global, Moolah once again had her manager's license approved, managing Leilani Kai to a brief women's title win before Moolah herself took the belt hostage once more. During the Attitude Era, Moolah and Mae Young would be regularly featured in WWE and were on opposing sides when managing Terry Runnels and the Cat respectively at WrestleMania 2000. Moolah cornered Terry to a win, of course. 
Number 72, Leo Rush. After a whirlwind tour of NXT and 205 Live, Leo Rush appeared on Raw as Bobby Lashley's new manager and hype man. He helped facilitate Bad Bob's heel turn before leading the ECW icon towards the Intercontinental title scene with Lashley winning the belt in a triple threat against Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose. Rush was brash, obnoxious, and just loved pointing at Lashley's muscular bum cheeks and was the little annoying scumbag you wanted to see get beat down. Which he was, a fair bit. Rush ended up losing Bob's IC title after getting pinned in a handicap match, helped him regain it, then could only watch on as the demon annihilated Lashley at WrestleMania 35. Number 71, General Adnan. When Vince McMahon wanted to inject a lethal dose of Americana into WWE, he thought the best course of action was to turn Sergeant Slaughter heel, have him pledge allegiance to Saddam Hussein, and play off the real-world Gulf War. Slaughter was soon joined by General Adnan and later Colonel Mustafa and was positioned as WWE's number one baddie. From a kayfabe POV, putting Slaughter with General Adnan drew a lot of heat and saw Sarge win the WWE Championship. However, from from a business POV, it was a disaster, with fans tuning out in droves and WrestleMania 7 moving to a smaller venue as a result. Number 70, Alexa Bliss. After several years atop of WWE's women's division, Alexa Bliss started to change, going fully off the deep end when Bray Wyatt and The Fiend suckered Bliss into their weird Firefly funhouse. Bliss saw no issues with this and gleefully started following Wyatt everywhere, especially as Bray sought to set Randy Orton on fire. When Wyatt disappeared for a while after being set on fire by Randall Keith, Bliss carried on The Fiend's work by attempting to set Orton on fire herself. A lot of fire, basically. Like a less problematic cane? Was this run good for Wyatt in kayfabe? Definitely not, but it certainly helped the presentation and added to the lore of the funhouse. Number 69, nice, Hillbilly Jim. Massive grinning lummox Hillbilly Jim was one of several specially selected Hogan mates in the 80s, hanging out with the Hulkster and making sure a cavalcade of baddies didn't harm his leathery hot dog skin. After sustaining an injury mid-run, Jim would stay ringside for various members of his family, but wouldn't do his best managerial work until the new gen era, cornering humble pig farmers, the Godwins. He would go on to lead Henry and Phineas to the WWE World Tag Team Championships in May 1996. Eventually, the lads would turn on Hillbilly Jim, and he would leave town for several years until returning for the WrestleMania X7 Gimmick Battle Royal. Number 68, Big Boss Man. Cobb County's finest resurfaced in WWE in 1998 after several years in WCW trying to avoid a copyright lawsuit. But something was amiss with Boss Man. Gone was his big smile and light blue shirt, in was a deep scowl and SWAT team tactical vest as Boss Man joined the corporation as Vince McMahon's private security. In this role, Boss Man would routinely paste people with his nightstick and would make sure the McMahons got away with murder, not literally. But soon, like many others before and since, the lure of competition was too great and Boss Man would end up winning the tag team and hardcore titles and would later to be hanged by The Undertaker at WrestleMania 15 before going off the deep end and killing a chihuahua. There was more scope for Boss Man in a strict bodyguard role, to be honest, but take out to beat someone at Mania, right? Number 67, Aiden English. What day is today? Why yes, it's Rusev Day! Same as yesterday and every other day, and we wouldn't have ever known it if it weren't for the silky sounds of Aiden English. Rudderless after the split of the Vord villains, English somehow found himself at the side of Rusev, and it's no hyperbole to say that the pairing became one of the most popular acts in all of WWE. Of course, WWE put the kibosh on their run because they clearly hate making money, and English made storyline advances to Toward Lana prompting Rusev to beat him without mercy. Number 66, Dusty Rhodes. The son of a plumber was enjoying his time running NXT when that pesky authority just had to meddle with his family's affairs, threatening the jobs of plumber's grandsons Dustin and Cody as well as that of Dusty himself. 
Not one to back down from bullies, Dusty G'd up his boys and was in their corner as they handed The Shield a rare loss at Battleground 2013, securing all their jobs in the process. With his work done, Dusty rode off into the sunset after being KO'd by a crying Big Show as his boys carried on the family legacy by winning the tag titles. Number 65, Cindy Lauper. Look, I know we said no celebrities, but an exception has to be made for Cindy Lauper. The Grammy winning pop star was a major factor in WWE's growing popularity during the rock and wrestling connection of the mid 80s, helping the company gain tons of eyes on the product due to her feuds with Roddy Piper and Captain Lou Albano. Lauper's greatest wrestling achievement came as the manager to Wendy Richter, cornering Wendy as she defeated women's champion Fabulous Moolah at the Brawl to End It All, ending Moolah's 28 year reign as millions tuned in to see it. Lauper would corner Richter again at the inaugural WrestleMania, spurring Wendy on to another title victory over Leilani Kai. Number 64, Chavo Classic. In 2004, Chavo Guerrero Jr. and Uncle Eddie were feuding, so Chavo's dad Chavo Classic popped in and said, don't you hurt my boy, you little tit, and stayed at Chavito's side. Soon after, Chavito made a beeline for the Cruiserweight Championship, and Classic helped him lie, cheat, and steal his way to the gold. To be fair to CC, he was effective in Chavito's corner, as Chavo overcame Rey Mysterio for the title, then somehow managed to keep hold of it at Wrestle Mania 20 with Papa's help. The low rider wheels eventually fell off when Chavo Classic accidentally won the bloody title himself, successfully defended the strap, and eventually dropped it to Little Ray Ray. Number 63, Michael Hayes. The best dressed man in wrestling and a certified tag wrestling legend, Michael Hayes left Doc Hendricks in the rearview mirror and took the young Hardy Boys under his purely sexy wing in 1999. The partnership helped the fledgling boys find their feet, with Hayes managing the pair to their first tag team titles with a win over the Acolytes in 1999, as audiences went, ooh, these young daredevils are as handsome as they are reckless. Unfortunately, this first title run was short-lived, with Matt and Jeff dropping the belts back to Farouk and Bradshaw a few weeks later. Hayes' job was done, the Hardys were established and didn't need PS anymore, so they turned on him and joined Gangrel instead to fang and or bang. Number 62, Pat Patterson and Gerald Briscoe. The greatest stooges since Larry, Curly, and Moe, Pat Patterson and Gerald Briscoe rolled back the years to become two of the most despised villains of the Attitude Era. The wrestling legends were the number one lackeys for Vince McMahon and the corporation, and time and time again, they ran in to interfere, bend the rules. Hell, why not even change the rules altogether? They could do whatever they wanted. As part of the biggest heel group in the company, Patterson and Briscoe were effective in their roles, making sure whatever corporation member they were assisting left with their hands raised, while Pat and Jerry usually ended up eating a stunner or two. The Stooges would stay by Vince's side during the McMahon-Helmsley era, but would fall out after Pat became jealous of how good-looking Jerry looked in an evening gown. Number 61, Trish Stratus. Before becoming one of the most respected women's wrestlers of a generation, Trish Stratus was on a mission to make TNA relevant. That's Test and Albert, not Jeff Jarrett's promotion. Whilst the team was relatively successful, they never broke through that glass ceiling, while Stratus herself got over like Rover due to the other TNA. Again, not Jeff Jarrett's promotion. Stratus would then corner Val Venus to Intercontinental Championship glory before deciding to get some of the wrestling gold for herself. In between women's champions, runs, Trish would still perform managerial duties from time to time, memorably becoming involved with creepy little bastard Christian as the Peep Master feuded with Chris Jericho. Stratus would also have short runs at the side of Jeff Hardy, Carlito, and WWE Champion Kurt Angle. Number 60, Afa. Wild Samoan and influential patriarch of the Anawahi family, Afa, returned to WWE in 1992 to guide his son Samu and nephew Fatu on to glory as the head shrinkers looked to carry on the Wild Samoans' work. Whilst Afa would school his young charges in the ways of the Wild Samoans, this largely boiled down to eating turkey meat and being a bit unhinged in the ring. Afa's methods seemed to work though, and after climbing the ranks, the team also brought in Wild Samoans manager Lou Albano to help out, with Samu and Fatu landing the WWE Tag Team titles in 1994. The reign would ultimately end at a house show because Shawn Michaels and Diesel just needed the belts, because of course they did. Click rule, loose. Number 59, Scarlet. 
The mark of a good manager is someone who enhances an in-ring talent shortcomings and helps with the overall presentation of a particular gimmick. With Scarlett, it can be argued that she is the reason for carrying Cross's success, as for all of Cross's in-ring accomplishments, it all falls flat without his peroxide wide-eyed handler being all creepy with hourglasses and wearing bondage gear. Case in point, Cross's original main roster debut, where the former NXT champion was on his own and was instantly reduced to a laughing stock before being released. Fast forward several months later and Cross was back in WWE with Scarlett and his credibility was instantly restored. Not wearing that helmet probably helped too, but you get my point. How this run pans out is still to be seen, as if Cross doesn't get enough consistent, meaningful wins and some gold, then not even Scarlet will be able to save him. Number 58. Ranjin Singh When the great Carly became World Heavyweight Champion, yes kids, it wasn't a fever dream, WWE made the wise decision of giving Carly a mouthpiece in the form of Ranjin Singh. The owner of the greatest sideburns since the Honky Tonk Man, Singh was there to dish out threats on behalf of the 7 foot Three monster and was in Carly's corner as he overcame the likes of Batista until Batista beat the big lad for the strap at Unforgiven 2007, that is. Eventually, Carly and Singh would turn face and dance a lot as Carly necked on with various women. Great stuff. The pairing would end acrimoniously when Jinder Mahal entered the scene, so Singh went back to working backstage in WWE, where he would remain until 2022. Number 57. Zelina Vega After rejuvenating Andrade Almas' career in NXT, Zelina Vega stayed by CN's side as they made their way to the main roster to so-so results. Vince had clearly never watched the pair in NXT, so bounced them from brand to brand, split them up for a bit, and then re united them. After this reunion, we got a taste of what they could do together as Zelina made sure Andrade kept hold of his US title, often assisting with a well-timed Hurricane Rana. Later, handsome Angel Garza joined in but kept bickering with Andrade, so Vega dropped them like a hot plate, was released, came back, then stole the Gardo del Fantasma away from Electra Lopez. Number 56. Big E Langston Back before he was part of the New Day, suggestively jiggling his puppies and talking about meaty men, Big E Langston was the muscle for Dolph Ziggler and AJ Lee, accompanying the show-off on his rise to the top. Although Ziggler's run at the top was cruel brief, it did produce an all-time pop when he cashed in on Alberto Del Rio for Big Goldie, with AJ and Big E ringside as Zigglypuff screamed his bloody lungs out. So when Ziggler was out of the picture with injury, Big E soldiered on, watching AJ's back as she made a successful beeline for Caitlyn's Divas title, but was soon placed on his own because, well, it's Big E, innit? He's great. Number 55. Dutch Mantel slash Zeb Coulter slash Uncle Zebakaya are you a hairy country boy in need of representation? Do you love America and want to do everything you can for the people? Are you Cesaro? Well, if you answered yes to any of the above, then you need Uncle Zebakaya Zeb Coulter. One of the top names of Glory Day's Memphis wrestling, Dutch Mantel had two stints in WWE as a manager, making his presence felt in the new gen and PG eras to different levels of success. First, he cornered of the Blue Brothers, but no one cared, and then unleashed Bradshaw on the world when Big John was pretending to be Stan Hansen. Fast forward to 2013, and Zeb Coulter had morphed into an alt-right cosplayer to do all the character work for Jack Swagger and later Antonio Cesaro, although the pair didn't actually gain any gold under Coulter's watch. Cesaro did win the Andre Battle Royal though, which is nice, I suppose. Zeb would later corner Alberto Del Rio as the two promoted Mex America, but it was crap. Number 54, Harvey Whippleman. Harvey Whippleman had one of those faces you just wanted to slap. That weedy little guy who hid behind the huge meathead and shook his fist at you as you got your head stomped in. Perfect heel heat. After cornering anachronistic carnival tough Big Billy Busick and the Warlord, Whippleman was paired with Sid Justice. Sid started demolishing the competition as he eyed a WrestleMania showdown with Hulk Hogan, with Dr. Harvey taking the pulse of jobbers after they had been Sidded. After Sid left town, Whippleman would corner Kamala for a bit, then Adam Bomb, then would bounce between clients of diminishing stature before introducing his girlfriend, Bertha Faye, to WWE, watching 
marching on as Bertha defeated Alundra Blaze for the women's title. A good character, a proper old school heel manager, but too many dud clients harm his standing on this list. Sorry, Harv. Number 53, Johnny Polo. All those unruly Quebecers being all Canadian and rude and telling Americans that they stink? Clearly, they must need even more heat, so let's put nerd with a polo mallet Johnny Polo with them. Whilst the pairing didn't make much sense thematically, it was at the tail end of managers being their own character in WWE, with Preppy Polo needing something to do since his pairing with nuclear monster Adam Bomb had just ended. Did. With his polo mallet in hand, Johnny helped guide the Quebecers to three tag team titles whilst also wrestling from time to time and doing stints on commentary. Eventually, Johnny would leave the polo mallet behind and would end up in ECW as the most miserable bastard on earth, Raven. Number 52, The Singh Brothers. It has been over five years since Jinder Mahal was WWE Champion, and it hasn't got any less weird. However, the fact remains that Jinder was the champ, and he couldn't have done it without the Singh Brothers being naughty little boys at ringside. From helping Jinder beat Randy Orton twice, to defeating Shinsuke Nakamura twice, and even a DQ win over John Cena, the Singh Brothers were super effective in keeping Mahal in power and took some hellacious bumps in the process. When Jinder eventually lost the gold to AJ Styles, WWE continued the Jinder experiment, with Sunil Singh helping the modern-day Maharaja win the US title at WrestleMania 34. Great work, boys, said Vince McMahon, promptly removing the Singhs from Jinder's side and throwing them into the 24-7 division before releasing them in 2021. Number 51, Rico. WWE is anything but subtle. In a world where every cowboy is more OTT than John Wayne on glue and every Englishman is posher than King Charles, then you can rest assured that LGBTQ plus characters will have an immense amount of stereotypes layered over the top. Case in point, Rico. Personal stylist to ambiguously gay duo Billy and Chuck, Rico was a metrosexual take on the likes of Goldust and Adrian Street, and effectively managed Billy and Chuck to several tag title runs and even picked one up for himself while he was at it. The character was on the nose, a little controversial, but worked due to Mr. Constantino's commitment to the bit. After Billy and Chuck's controversial non-wedding, Rico would align with Three Minute Warning before jumping back into the ring with Miss Jackie at his side. Number 50, Clarence Mason. After swapping the law offices for the raw offices, attorney Clarence Mason was hired as Jim Cornette's legal counsel as the Camp Cornette head honcho looked to sue WWE President Gorilla Monsoon over a dodgy title change. Despite being, you know, an actual practicing attorney, Mason hung around with Cornette and crew for most of 1996 before bringing Crush back to WWE following the former Dem militia members stint in jail. Mason's greatest triumph came when he began representing Farouk, with the two forming the Nation of Domination in late 1996. However, Mason allegedly felt uncomfortable with some of the nation's more racially sensitive content, so he left the company and ended up in WCW managing the underrated Canyon and the absolutely abysmal Harlem Heat 2000. Number 49, Hornswoggle. Hey, you know Finley? Yeah, well, he's from Northern Ireland, so obviously he needed an actual leprechaun in his corner to help him win matches. But actually, it wasn't a leprechaun, it was his son. Or was it Vince McMahon's? Where was I going? Ah, oh, yes, Hornswoggle, the small, filthy mute who hung around Finley, biting people and being a generally cheeky lad. Still, he was very popular during his time in WWE, with Hornswoggle somehow becoming a member of D-Generation X, although he didn't get a Hall of Fame spot, which was frankly out of order. Justice for Swoggle! Whilst WWE may have milked the Swoggle teat until it was dry, Swoggle himself managed to have a 10-year run with the company, where he also spent time as both a small cow and an alligator. And whatever the hell Brodus Clay was. Was it a dinosaur? Why not? Number 48, Kosro Davari. We can agree that 99% of the Muhammad Hassan angle was in very poor taste, but the Hassan act was pushed as a huge deal for a minute, with Davari on hand to do Hassan's bidding and fan the flames of outrage. 
close to sand, Davari landed on his feet as the right-hand man of Kurt Angle, managing Angle to World Heavyweight Championship glory on Angle's first night on SmackDown. And then he got in Angle's way a few days later and got fired on Raw. Easy come, easy go. Not one to kick his feet and do nothing, Davari instead cornered Mark Henry and then watched on as the great Carly brain-chopped The Undertaker all over SmackDown. Say what you want about his run, but that is a half-decent list of clients. Number 47, Alex Riley. A cross between Walter the Muppet and The Miz, a Ry was paired up with the latter as Miz made his then unlikely run toward the top of WWE. First coming together on NXT with Miz as Riley's mentor, Riley would later sign a personal services contract, becoming Miz's first official apprentice, basically a lackey to take a beating when Miz was too cowardly to face the music. The pairing was very successful though, with Riley helping Miz gain the WWE Championship from Randy Orton and was a vital distraction as Miz somehow overcame John Cena at WrestleMania 27. I mean, The Rock helped too, but whatever. Miz would later drop the title to Cena at Extreme Rules, and guess who wasn't ringside? That's right, Alex Riley, the decision maker. Eventually, the two would split off, and it looked like we would be getting a DiBiase Virgil scenario until Riley cooled off quicker than a pie on a windowsill. Number 46, The Roadie. Every good musician needs a road manager to make sure their gigs go smoothly, and the world's greatest country singer Jeff Jarrett was no exception, bringing in The Roadie to set up his mics and to help him cheat at every possible opportunity. With the roadie at his side, Jarrett would pick up the Intercontinental title on several occasions and would even release the platinum selling with my baby tonight. A certified banger, although it would later transpire that it was actually Roadie himself who sang on the track and not Double J. After the pair left WWE for Pastures New, well, the USWA, Roadie would eventually change his mind, returning to the Fed on his own, christening himself the Road Dog, and becoming one of the biggest stars of the Attitude Era through his runs in the New Age Outlaws and DX. Not bad. Number 45, Jose Lothario. It's difficult to know what to say about Jose Lothario. On one hand, Super Sock guided his real-life protege Shawn Michaels to the WWE Championship, training HBK for his legendary Iron Man match against Bret Hart at WrestleMania 12, and cornering Michaels as he regained the belt from Psycho Sid at Royal Rumble 97. On the other hand, Michaels just didn't need Lothario in his corner, as the Heartbreak Kid was in his pump in the ring and on the mic in the mid-90s, whilst Jose just stood around looking happy in a selection of nice shirts. Still, Lothario's presence didn't take anything away from HBK, and it certainly helped Sean's rise from the mid-card to the face of the new generation. Plus, those shirts, just fabulous. Number 44, Rick Rude. The owner of the greatest moustache this side of your dad, Rick Rude shockingly returned to WWE after a seven-year hiatus, joining Shawn Michaels, Triple H, and China as the ragtag trio's insurance policy, becoming the final piece in the puzzle of what would become D-Generation X. Rude would antagonize people on the mic as China stood there looking hard, and HBK and Hunter pretended sausages were willies and laughed at nudity and other childish larks. The group would soon become the main heel act of the company, but just as they they were taking off, Rude would leave WWE in disgust after the Montreal Screwjob, swiveling his hips down to Atlanta to join the NWO in WCW. Number 43, Sami Zayn. One of the more head-scratching booking decisions by Vince McMahon in his latter years in charge of WWE was lumping Shinsuke Nakamura, Cesaro, and Sami Zayn together as the Artist Collective, with an injured Zayn serving as little more than a hyperactive stickman to cover for Nakamura and Cesaro's perceived lack of mind skills. The group was successful, sure, and Zayn was a big reason, eventually winding up IC Champ during his time in charge, but it felt like all three could have been doing so much more. When the collective crumbled and Sammy became the conspiracy theorist we know and love, it felt like a better use of everyone's talents. Flash forward to 2023 and Zayn's run as the Bloodline's lackey and personal geek was one of the most over acts in all of wrestling before their inevitable collapse. Now that is Usu. Number 42, Mr. McMahon. After stepping away from the announce desk, screwing over Bret Hart, and becoming the biggest heel in wrestling history, Vince McMahon went to war with Stone Cold Steve Austin, building an entire corporation to help him take down the Rattlesnake. 
The jewel of this corporation was The Rock, and McMahon often accompanied the corporate champion ringside and made sure that Rocky left with the gold by any means necessary. Hell, if any corporation member needed some help, then McMahon was usually not far behind. Vince would also corner Rock going into WrestleMania 2000, but turned on him for poops and chuckles, and would also befriend Brock Lesnar in 2003. Over the years, Vince would appear at ringside for various wrestlers when storylines and ratings needed some bionic boosting, such as Austin Theory and that nonsense with the golden egg at Survivor Series 2021. Whilst McMahon was technically not a manager, he was too important to leave off this list. Thank goodness we had all those rules at the beginning of the video, and all YouTube viewers are level-headed and accepting of our opinions. Number 41, Natalia. Originally debuting as Victoria's personal hired goon, Natalia soon settled into the Divas division until boyfriend Tyson Kidd needed some assistance in ECW. Forming the Hart Dynasty with D.H. Smith, the trio took the WWE tag division by storm, winning the tag titles and even feuding with Vince McMahon after Uncle Brett came back for his six-star classic at WrestleMania 26. After the dynasty imploded and Natalia got bored of wrestling, she ended up farting a lot before shacking up with the great Carly and Hornswoggle. Must have sneezed in Vince's face to deserve such a fate. Whilst any sane person would have quit WWE, Natalia soldiered on and threw her managerial support behind Tyson Kidd and Cesaro, managing the pair to the WWE tag titles, and since the untimely end of Tyson Kidd's career, Natalia has been on hand to do whatever is needed of her in WWE. Thankfully, with less farting. Number 40, Armando Estrada. When Umaga burst onto the scene in 2006, he was accompanied by Armando Alejandro Estrada, a cigar-chomping, Panama hat-wearing, Cuban sleazeball who handled the affairs of the Samoan bulldozer and set him on people like a big mad dog. Despite both the Estrada and Umaga gimmicks being a little passe, the pairing worked very well, with Estrada soon taking the undefeated Umaga all the way to the WWE title scene. Whilst Umaga didn't land the big one, Estrada still guided Umaga to the Intercontinental title before being written off of TV by being thrown into a load of bins because Umaga was now hanging out with the McMahons and there just wasn't any room for our fedora-wearing friend. Estrada would end up as ECW's GM and as Tyson Kidd's manager for one night on Superstars. Number 39, Luscious Johnny V slash Johnny Valiant. A tag team specialist during his days as one half of the Valiant Brothers, Johnny V returned to WWE in 1984 to guide a heelish Brutus beefcake, later taking the reins of the Dream Team when Brother Bruti teamed up with IC champion Greg Valentine. With luscious Johnny V at the helm, the Dream Team shot straight to the top of the tag scene, defeating the US Express for the tag titles and holding them for around eight months until dropping them to the British Bulldogs at WrestleMania 2, a match which was built around how can the Bulldogs stop Johnny V? The answer was seemingly bring Ozzy Osbourne out in a pink suit. Beefcake was duly kicked out and Valiant's other client, Dino Bravo, was inserted into the team, but this iteration did sod all, with Valiant eventually phased out as a manager. Number 38, Ricardo Rodriguez. With Mr. Kennedy having been hoyed out of WWE, there was a big over-the-top ring announcer-shaped hole in the company. When Alberto Del Rio came into WWE, the Fed went, yes, give him a Kennedy, and thus Ricardo Rodriguez was born. Having Ricardo enthusiastically announce his arrival did help Alberto stand out, enhancing the overall package of smarmy rich bellend, a tough role for Del Rio to play, I'm sure. Ricardo also proved a difference maker during Alberto's matches too, assisting in any deceitful way he could to make sure Del Rio got to the top. I mean, he ran over Big Show for a start. That is dedication. After several world title runs for Del Rio and a ton of beatings from the big boys, Rodriguez ended up by the side of Rob Van Dam and it was a terrible mismatch. Should have given Del Rio Bill Alfonso while they were at it. Number 37, Melina. One of the M's in Eminem, Melina grabbed WWE fans' attention from the get-go with her risque splits entrance and incessant ear-piercing screaming during Eminem's matches. Although the second golden age of WWE's tag division had ended, Eminem were a beacon for tag wrestling in the company, with Melina helping mastermind three tag title runs for the team, whilst also 
also cornering Johnny Nitro for his first two IC title wins. The whole presentation of Eminem was key for success, with the whole Hollywood knobhead persona complete with paparazzi making them feel like a hell of a big deal. Melina was front and centre for the team, doing all the character work to get the team over, whilst Nitro and Mercury worked their fur-lined bums off between the ropes. Unfortunately, Eminem's run wasn't really that long, and Melina would find greater success in the women's slash divas division. Number 36, Shane McMahon. Shane McMahon did it all during his time in WWE. Referee, European champion, WCW owner, whatever you want really. But this is a managers and other people list, and quietly Shane cornered some of the biggest names in wrestling history. Big Show at Mania 2000, the often forgotten conspiracy, Benoit Angle, Show Edge and Christian, the corporate ministry, the McMahon Helmsley faction, that weird little crew with Drew McIntyre, FTR and Elias, you catch my drift. Like his dad before him, it's difficult to know what to say about Shane O'Mac in a managerial sense. He did what he wanted on TV when it served the storylines, and all the shine ultimately went to him, arguably the antithesis of what a manager should be. But still, no one delivered a match-changing chair shot like Shane, and he helped several slimy world champions keep their grubby mitts on the gold. Number 35, Triple H. As he is technically a McMahon, Triple H can also do whatever he wants in WWE, both in kayfabe and in reality. After sorta kinda ending his in-ring career, Triple H threw his weight behind the authority, pulling the strings as Seth Rollins turned his back on the shield and masterminding Rollins' rise to the top of WWE, both behind the scenes and on screen. Tripper even made sure his old pal Randy Orton got a slice of the action too, by helping the shy and retiring Randall get his hands on the world title for the 15th time. Soon, the authority were dominating WWE TV, with Triple H spewing venom on the mic. But Trips gonna Trips, and when the world title was up for grabs in the 2016 Royal Rumble, he just couldn't help himself, could he? Basically saying F these kids and grabbing the gold for himself. Number 34, Maurice. Whilst Miz has had his fair share of managers, valets, and gormless lackeys over the years, none have complimented him half as well as his wife. Maurice, formerly the manager of Deuce and Domino and Ted DiBiase Jr. Ten pounds if you remember that. Maurice was paired with the Miz when she returned to WWE in 2016, helping Miz win the Intercontinental Championship on her first night back. The two would unsuccessfully feud with John Cena and Nikki Bella, but Maurice would prove to be the difference maker when Miz took on Daniel Bryan and would also smack Beth Phoenix with a brick in a purse because why the hell not? This is a sport after all. Oh, and let's not forget Miz and Mrs. That should make Maurice a shoe in for number one, to be honest. All joking aside, Miz just feels more of a big deal and an even smarmier tit when he's got Maurice on his lucky, lucky arm. Number 33, Damien Mizdow. But for as good as Maurice is at the side of the Miz, no one has been as entertaining with Big Mike than his own personal stunt double, Damien Mizdow. At first, just something for Damien Sandow to do because he had nothing on, the former intellectual savior of the masses took the ball and bloody sprinted with it, becoming one of the most popular stars on WWE TV and making Miz matches unmissable. Okay, so you could argue that he took the shine off the Miz somewhat, with his flailing at ringside and mirrored selling of whatever the Miz was dealing with in ring, but it managed to generate immense heat for Miz, who would shut down Miz Dow shenanigans and demand all the attention on himself. Eventually, the two would end up as tag champs, with Miz Dow carrying two toy belts as Miz hogged the real ones, and the fans waited for the massive blow-off that happened in the Andre Battle Royal, which Miz Dow lost to Big Show. Oh. Number 32, The Genius. A poet, a polymath, limber and nimble, and with a smug sense of self-satisfaction, audiences loved to hate the genius of glory and renown in the late 1980s. Although a singles wrestler in his own right, Genius ended up as an executive consultant to Mr. Perfect, as Perfect set his sights on Hulk Hogan's WWE Championship, with Genius hoodwinking the Hulkster and joining Perfect as the pair smashed the title with a hammer. As the 90s rolled into sight, Genius stepped away from the ring and 
threw his weight behind the sound but bland Beverly Brothers, with the team scrapping with the likes of the Legion of Doom and Natural Disasters before transitioning into a jobber to the stars role. Despite this, you can't help but love the genius. He should have been given more managerial opportunities, but made the most of what he had, reciting self-penned poetry, delivering promos in his own unique way, with his not-so-subtle campiness making him a memorable pantomime villain. Number 31, AJ Lee. For one of the most talented women's wrestlers on their roster, WWE were just obsessed with positioning AJ Lee as unhinged girlfriend to the stars, with AJ romantically involved on screen with Daniel Bryan, CM Punk, John Cena, Kane, even Hornswoggle for a bit in NXT. AJ's most memorable stint on the sidelines was as the doting beau of world heavyweight champion Daniel Bryan, with AJ ever present as the first seeds of the Yes movement were sown. Then again, she was also the reason Sheamus squashed Brian at WrestleMania 28 in 18 seconds. Awkward. AJ was also at the side of Dolph Ziggler as the show-off lifted Big Goldie and would later be aligned with Big E after the pair turned on Ziggler, although she was soon better utilized as the pillar of the Divas division. In an era when managers and valets were a rarity, AJ Lee seized every opportunity and made herself invaluable to WWE. Number 30, Cowboy Bob Orton. Despite being legitimately hard as nails, Rowdy Roddy Piper sought to have some protection as he barked his way up the WWE card, with the ace cowboy Bob Orton watching Piper's back as he made a beeline for Hulk Hogan. Orton was very effective in his role, using his arm cast as a weapon to KO Piper's opponents and held his own during skirmishes at Piper's side. Orton would also have Paul Laundorf's back as Piper and Mr. Wonderful squared off against Hogan and Mr. T at WrestleMania 1, but would ultimately cost the team the match. You had one job, Bob. Ace would depart the company shortly after a run with Adrian Adonis, but would return in 2005 to corner son Randall Keith against The Undertaker, helping Randy get several wins over Undy. Bob would disappear from Randy's side after Taker reportedly blew up at him backstage for blading during a Hell in a Cell match after it was revealed that the cowboy had hepatitis C. Number 29, J&J &J Security. After Seth Rollins broke free of the shield and nestled in the warm bosom of the authority, Papa H decided his special boy needed round-the-clock protection from gormless lackeys Jamie Noble and Joey Mercury. As a package, Seth Rollins and J&J &J Security was effective in that Rollins kept his hands on the title as audiences bayed for his blood, whilst Noble and Mercury boiled people's piss and usually got an RKO for their troubles. Time and time again, Rollins would find a way to hide behind his security before weaseling away with the goods, and it made him one of the most effective heels of a generation. Eventually, all their luck would run out, as Brock Lesnar absolutely savaged the pair like a bear with a lump of meat, and Rollins was forced to go solo once more. Number 28, Vicky Guerrero. Excuse me. Just two words were all Vicky needed to command attention and receive a barrage of hate from the audience. Was it the right kind of heat? Arguable, but what can't be argued is how Vicky was for a time the top heel manager in WWE. After handling the affairs of Chavo Guerrero, Vicky would become the matriarch of La Familia whilst also serving as SmackDown GM, meaning that whatever Vicky wanted, Vicky got. Well, more accurately, Edge got. Whilst La Familia were a bit weak overall, Edge was anything but, and with Vicky's help, he cemented himself as a main event heel and won a boatload of titles. After a brief hiatus, Vicky would return at the side of Lay Cool and would also guide Dolph Ziggler to the World Heavyweight title, kinda, and the US title, and would also oversee a US title win for Jack Swagger. Vicky also managed Eric Escobar. Remember him? Of course you don't. Still, the rest were good, weren't they? From coming in in the wake of Eddie's tragic death to becoming a seasoned pro, it is commendable how good Vicky got in a relatively short amount of time. Number 27, Ric Flair. When you think of Ric Flair, you usually think of the glittering in-ring career, the famous promos, and the unfortunate private life. But thinking on, you will realize that he was actually a very successful manager in WWE. 
Prophet Adam. He only married Charlotte, you tit. Oh no, he didn't, because technically, Flair was originally the manager of Evolution before dusting off his little blue undies and winning titles for himself once again. Yes, Flair was the kayfabe brains behind Triple H's reign of terror, guided the rise of Randy Orton and Batista, even tagging with Big Dave to give him his first taste of championship gold. Flair would again corner Orton later in the Viper's career until Orton attacked him, almost like he's some kind of snake. They weren't all home runs though, Flair's pairing with The Miz just didn't work and the whole Flair shagging Lacey Evans thing was just a bit grim, weren't it? But hey, Rick helped Charlotte really spread her wings on Maine, giving her the Flair rub until the Queen didn't need her old fella anymore. Number 26, Sable. One of the most popular stars of the Attitude Era, Sable got over with wrestling fans due to, well, nudity. Come on, we were all young and horny once upon a time. Originally on the arm of Hunter Hearst Helmsley, Sable soon ended up at the side of her real-life husband, Wildman Mark Merrow, with the name Sable referring to a species of Martin, a kind of small weasel. Don't quote me on that. Soon, with Merrow out of action with injury, Sable took centre stage and became one of the biggest acts of the era. Okay, so it may have all but killed Merrow's career, but Sable stuck by Merrow's side, and WWE realised that the answer was to turn their relationship into a jealous husband angle, getting Sable even more over than ever before. When Sable got into the ring, it all fell apart because she was frankly terrible at wrestling, and although her valet services didn't really help Marvelous Mark, she is still iconic. Number 25, Mr. Perfect. In 1991, Mr. Perfect's back was knackered and he needed something to do to keep his name out there in the minds of WWE fans. Luckily, the real world's champion, Ric Flair, was new in town and required someone with a little savvy to watch his back as Bobby Heenan advised from the sidelines. As Flair's executive consultant, Perfect assisted the dirtiest player in the game by playing dirty, distracting refs, conning officials, berating commentary, and smacking someone in the face when necessary. As the crown jewel of the NWA, there would have been some fans in WWE not clued into what Flair was about, so by aligning him with two of the biggest heels in the company in Perfect and Heenan, it successfully brought Nate to their level in the eyes of those fans. Perfect would be ever-present as Flair lifted the WWE title on two occasions and would be a vital ally as Flair tormented Randy Savage and the Ultimate Warrior. Perfect eventually healed up and Flair was heading for the exit, so the union was kiboshed and Perfect sent Flair back to WCW. Number 24, Debra. After Jeff Jarrett resurfaced in WWE in 1997, he was fairly rudderless, first hanging around the lame NWA invasion angle, then getting routinely battered by X-Pac and Al Snow until Debra jumped ship from WCW to once again manage Jarrett's affairs. Cornering the makeshift team of Jarrett and Owen Hart, the duo were off to the races, winning the World Tag Team titles with Debra in their corner as a difference maker. After Owen's tragic death in 1999, Jarrett and Debra continued continued on, with Jarrett winning IC and European gold, Jarrett becoming the second ever Eurocontinental champion in the process. Debra would later be paired with husband Stone Cold Steve Austin, playing a minor role in the storied Austin Rock feud for WrestleMania X7. Debra would stay at Austin's side, routinely having her baking skills mocked during their run in the Alliance until Austin walked out of the company. Number 23, Luna Vachon. With a voice like a horse that smokes 50 a day and a gnarled face covered in lightning bolts, it's safe to say that Luna Vachon turned heads, especially when she turned up in WWE Out of the Blue at Intercontinental Champion Shawn Michaels' side at WrestleMania 9. Tough as nails and genuinely terrifying, Luna was in town to pummel Sherry Martel on HBK's behalf, but soon left Michaels to become Bam Bam Bigelow's main squeeze. Luna would later introduce the awesome Bull Nakano to American audiences as Bull Death decimated Alundra Blaze for the women's title. After several years away, Luna would resurface in 1997 at the side of the artist formerly known as Goldust after the bizarre one went completely off the deep end. The pairing was perfect, with the snarling Luna complementing the gimp suit wearing Goldie like cheese to a cracker. Stints in and out of the ring followed until Luna got her first babyface managerial run in WWE with the oddities and the insane clown posse. It was a quick run, but it was remarkably over at the time. Whilst Luna's managerial services gained little in the way of championships or major pushes, she is unquestionably an icon and highly influential. 
Number 22, Slick. He's a jive soul bro, a jive soul bro, and one of the most fondly remembered managers of the 80s. It is the Doctor of Style, Slick. The Slickster's run in WWE wasn't particularly long, but it came at the right time, with Slick establishing himself in the middle of the rock and wrestling boom, taking over several of Freddie Blassie's clients. Slick's masterstroke would come when he first of all turned one man gang into Akeem the African Dream, don't ask, then partnered the big lad with fellow big lad, Big Boss lad, sorry, man, as the Twin Towers. With Slick cutting deals left and right, the Twin Towers went straight to the top of the card, battling against the Mega Powers. Slick would also corner the likes of Rick Martel, the Warlord, and the Iron Sheik, amongst others, and would later become a panelist on Primetime Wrestling. Number 21, Queen Charmel. With Booker T having shaken off that loss to Triple H at WrestleMania 19, it was time for Booker to freshen up his image and re-establish himself, eventually bringing his wife Charmel in as he feuded with Kurt Angle on his way up the SmackDown card. Charmel would grow into her role and would subtly turn heel by helping a seemingly oblivious Booker T cheat his way to the US title with a victory over Chris Benoit, but Booker revealed it was all a ruse and anyone who thought otherwise was a sucker! Success continued for Booker with Charmel at his side, culminating in the coronation of King Booker and Queen Charmel in 2006, with the pair affecting over-the-top pretentious accents and clearly having a lot of fun in the role. King Booker would continue to add gold to his haul, winning the World Heavyweight Championship and successfully defending against the likes of John Cena, The Big Show, Batista, and Lashley, with Queen Charmel often causing a ruckus to make sure WWE's royal family stayed golden. Charmel was rewarded for her efforts with a spot in the WWE Hall of Fame in 2022. Number 20, Ted DiBiase. The Million Dollar Man was thoroughly knackered in the early 90s, and after one last hurrah in All Japan, returned to WWE to provide commentary and managerial duties, an obvious choice as DiBiase was one of the biggest and most charismatic heels of the 1980s. Forming the Million Dollar Corporation, Ted would handle the affairs of Bam Bam Bigelow, Sid, Tatonka, the 123 Kid, and even a fake Undertaker for the hell of it. But despite taking Bam Bam to the main event of WrestleMania 11, the group was ultimately nothing more than high profile losers, although Ted was still golden on the mic. As the group started to slowly disintegrate, DiBiase had one last roll of the dice and introduced the world to the Ringmaster, a man quickly rechristened as Stone Cold Steve. Steve Austin. You might have heard of him. Eventually, WCW offered the Million Dollar Man a trillion dollars, and WWE realized that Austin was quite good at talking on his own, so the two sides shook hands and Ted left town to bankroll the NWO instead. Number 19, Terry Runnels slash Marlena. When Goldust first arrived in WWE, the gimmick was highly controversial, with WWE accused of creating gay panic due to the characteristics and mannerisms of the Bizarre One. In order to tone down this aspect of the character, they brought in Goldust's real-life wife Terry Runnels to be at his side, with WWE christening her Marlena after Hollywood royalty Marlena Dietrich. As the cigar-chomping icy handler of Goldust, Marlena added an extra dimension to the Goldust character, watching on as Goldie reigned as Intercontinental Champion and inadvertently becoming one of the foundation stones for the burgeoning Attitude Era. The two were unpredictable and creepy and routinely pushed the boundaries of taste in a WWE finding a new identity. They even won a Slammy in 1997 for Best Couple, which was nice, I suppose. After Goldust, Marlena would spend time at the side of Brian P. Hillman, not her choice, then under her real name would manage D'Lo Brown and Mark Henry and also meet as part of Pretty Mean Sisters. Terry would also briefly manage Edge and Christian and the Hardys as the tag scene booted up again in 1999, then would join the Radicals predominantly as Perry Saturn's valet. After being replaced by an actual mop, Terry would soon hitch her wagon to Raven. Number 18, Lana. With WWE going back to the 80s with big bad Russian menace Rusev, they thought, let's go full on Rocky IV, and had the ravishing Russian Lana act as the sneering mouthpiece for the big lad, bringing the pair up from 
NXT in 2014. Seemingly, what was once old was new again as Lana and Rusev became one of the top acts in WWE, seizing the US Championship in November 2014 and trouncing all manner of American heroes before rocking up to WrestleMania 31 in a goddamn tank to face John Cena. Lamentably, this would be the pair's peak as soon Summer Rae, Dolph Ziggler, Acid Wash Denim, and Fish got involved, breaking something that ultimately didn't need fixing. Lana and Rusev would continue off and on before Rusev's release in 2020, with Lana also cornering Bobby Lashley after, yes, another angle where she necked on with someone other than the Bulgarian brute. Despite never reaching the heights the act arguably should have, Lana and Rusev together for a short period was money, and reminded WWE and fans alike how valuable a good manager can be. Number 17, MVP. The owner and proprietor of the VIP Lounge, MVP returned to WWE in 2020 and soon threw his weight behind Bobby Lashley, cornering the almighty as he went after WWE champion Drew McIntyre. Soon, MVP would also recruit Shelton Benjamin and Cedric Alexander as he built the Hurt Business, with the group wanting nothing more than total domination over Raw. Bedecked in fine suits, with the always captivating MVP on the mic laying out their their aims and wants, it wasn't long until gold came their way, with Lashley winning the US title, Shelton and Cedric lifting the Raw tag titles, and Bobby adding the WWE Championship to his trophy hall in 2021. MVP would eventually turf Shelton and Cedric out of the group and focused his efforts on Lashley, guiding the champ through several successful defenses, including a dominant win over Drew at WrestleMania 37. For some reason, MVP eventually decided that Lashley was past his best and switched allegiance to O. Moss instead, which was frankly a terrible business decision. True, MVP was one of a handful of managers in an era where the role didn't really exist, but he was used effectively and accentuated the positives of every talent he worked with. Even Omos. Number 16, Diesel. With Shawn Michaels free of the rockers and having sent Sherry and Luna packing, he realized that he needed someone to cash the checks his mouth wrote, bringing in the hulking seven foot tall Diesel as his own personal one man wrecking crew. Big Daddy Cool made an instant impact, helping Shawn regain the Intercontinental Championship from Marty Jannetty as Vince looked on from gorilla position with heart eyes as his two favorite lads got over with the crowd whilst ruffling everyone's feathers backstage. The pairing was almost too successful, as when the decision was made to put Diesel in the ring, he was pushed even harder than HBK, with the two soon splitting due to Diesel landing the WWE title. Regardless of your thoughts on Diesel as opposed to Kevin Nash and the new generation in general, Diesel is still the measuring stick for bodyguards in WWE, with the company spending the best part of 30 years hoping to capture the magic once again. Number 15, Stephanie McMahon Helmsley. In the late 90s, Stephanie McMahon was the sweet girl next door, going on dates with Test and getting sacrificed by The Undertaker and forced into marriage with Satan. So wholesome. Then, one day after being drugged and married to Triple H, Steph went all Sandra D at the end of Greece, aligning with her husband as the two sought to take over WWE as the McMahon Helmsley era went into full swing. Steph was the final piece of the puzzle for Trips, and when she started accompanying him to his matches, he really hit his stride as a true main event heel, and people would tune in week in, week out to see if the pair of smarmy bastards would get their comeuppance. Okay, so Steph's run at the side of Chris Jericho unfortunately didn't have quite the same effect, but when she reunited with Tripper as the authority, we all remembered just how effective the pair were at drawing heat. Opening every Raw with a 45-minute promo about themselves was a step too far, though. Plus, without Stephanie McMahon, the Alliance would have crumbled without the might of her vision as the mastermind of ECW. ECW! ECW! Number 14, Virgil. In the 80s, there was arguably no bigger heel in all of WWE than the million dollar man Ted DiBiase, the wide eyed, cackling egomaniac who insisted that everyone had a price. No matter what schemes Ted hatched in or out of the ring, he usually left the dirty work to his trusty manservant Virgil, a steely eyed, bow tie sporting henchman who was always on hand to smack someone in the face at the drop of a hat. Time and time again, 
morning, Ted would get off scot-free with his shenanigans due to Virgil's interference, or they'd come up as due to Virgil taking one for the team. By the time Virgil turned on Ted in 1991, the fans were absolutely rabid to see him break free, as Virgil had been at DiBiase's side for nearly five years. Talk about long-term storytelling. Soon, though, everything petered out, and Virgil, sorry, Vincent, would find himself back up to his old tricks with Ted in the NWO. Virgil would eventually return to WWE in 2010, once more as a lackey to Ted DiBiase. Junior. Yeah, so maybe that didn't hold a candle to his time with Ted Senior, but Virgil's original run still holds up today. I mean, hell, why else do you think fans give him that F money? Number 13, Sonny. While Sable eventually became the literal pinup girl for the Attitude Era, it is arguable that she wouldn't have been anywhere near as successful if it wasn't for the path already forged by Sonny. Vivacious and charismatic, Sonny came in at the side of Skip as the Body Donners, later managing Skip and Zip to Tag Glory, before binning them for Tag Champs the Godwins, then binning them off for Tag Champs the Smoking Guns. WWE realized that they had a genuine breakout star in the waiting and pushed Sonny hard as one of the faces of Raw in 95 and 96, with Sonny eventually becoming one of the most downloaded people in the early days of the internet. Fans just loved her and fancy the pants off her let's be honest now. But still, Sonny was effectively used, first bringing Gladiator of the Future Farouk Assad into WWE, then later being ringside in a head-turning flame top to take charge of LOD 2000. Eventually, Sonny would leave for ECW, then WCW, and her private life spiralled out of control. But for those of a certain age, Sonny will always be their number one, because what Sonny wants, Sonny gets. Number 12, Freddie Blassie. Whilst the Hollywood fashion plate was winding down his career as WWE entered its 80s boom period, classy Freddie Blassie still had a part to play as the rock and wrestling connection took flight. One of the most influential managers in WWE history and part of the fabled triumvirate of terror with the Grand Wizard and Captain Lou Albano, Blassie formally managed to heal Hulk Hogan and guided Iron Sheik to the WWE Championship, sticking with Sheik as WWE went through the stratosphere. Running down all the pencil-necked geeks in the audience, Blassie insulted everyone in sight and broke every rule as he helped Sheik and Nikolai Volkov win the tag titles in 1985, landing the gold at the inaugural WrestleMania thanks to an illegal shot from Blassie's cane. After Sheik and Volkov dropped the belts, Blassie stuck by the two but slowly started to phase out of WWE, eventually retiring in 1986. Again, if this was an all-time manager's list, then Blassie would be much higher. I mean, the man managed Muhammad Ali at one point. That is amazing. Number 11, Lita. During the height of the Attitude Era, the role of managers was shifting, with managers, valets and whatnot expected to be able to go in the ring as well as from the sidelines. No one exemplified this more than Lita, with the former Miss Congeniality coming in at the side of S.A. Rios, dishing out Hurricane Rana's and Moonsaults to anyone who stepped to her. The run with Rios didn't last long, as Lita soon joined the Hardy Boys to form Team Extreme, quickly becoming one of the most popular acts in all of wrestling. Lita was not afraid to get physical. I mean, just ask Spike Dudley, who received a brutal chair shot from her during TLC2. After several years concentrating on singles gold in the women's division, Lita returned to Matt Hardy's side before being forced to marry Kane. When Lita's affair with Hardy's pal Edge was made public, Lita became one of the most hated members of the WWE roster. WWE ran with this, pairing Lita and Edge on screen as Edge was established as the top heel in the company, with Edge winning the WWE Championship during this rated R period. Eventually, the abuse Lita faced from fans and the scrutiny of her private life was too much, and Lita herself retired at Survivor Series 2006. A much-deserved WWE Hall of Fame induction followed in 2014. Number 10, China. It is no hyperbole to say that China changed the game when she arrived in 1997, with the ninth wonder of the world soon becoming one of the biggest stars in the industry. Coming in as Triple H's bodyguard, China was instantly positioned as, quite frankly, a hard-as-nails enforcer just begging for a fight. Didn't matter who, what, where, or why, if they got in Triple H's way, then China would punch them square in the balls. 
and the crowd bloody loved it. As Triple H made his way up the card, China's visibility increased, and her propensity for testicular trauma ensured that Hunter won a litany of championships. So effective was China in the role that WWE eventually put her in the men's singles division as seemingly every other company on the planet debuted their own China ripoffs. Yeah, Asia, we're looking at you. As Trips rode off with Stephanie McMahon, China found herself the object of Eddie Guerrero's affection, eventually succumbing to his charm and becoming his mamacita. This was a short-lived yet very popular pairing. But it all comes back to that initial run with Triple H and D-Generation X, a role that set her on the path to superstardom and earned a rightful place in the WWE Hall of Fame for China. Number 9. Captain Lou Albano Another classic manager who did most of his work before WWE's explosion in 1984, Captain Lou was the king of the tag scene, all but guaranteeing tag gold for whomever he was cornering. Arguably Albano's greatest contribution came as the catalyst for the rock and wrestling connection, with Captain Lou slap bang in the middle of the action as he feuded with pop star Cindy Lauper. Although Albano was eventually unsuccessful in his war with Lauper, his stock rose dramatically Dramatically, with Captain Lou turning face and managing the likes of Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, and any other face who needed support against WWE's ever-growing rogues gallery. Captain Lou remained a tag specialist, first guiding the US Express to the tag titles and later masterminding the British Bulldogs rise to the top, with Dynamite Kid and Davey Boy Smith defeating the Dream Team for the straps at WrestleMania 2. After several years away from the company, Captain Lou would return in 1994 to oversee the Head Shrinkers tag title win with Affa, then would once again leave town, presumably returning to the Mushroom Kingdom. Number 8. Miss Elizabeth When Randy Savage made his grand arrival to WWE in 1985, every manager in the game entered a bidding war for Savage's signature, with Macho Man spurning all of their advances in favour of the lovely Miss Elizabeth. Pretty and demure, Elizabeth was a 180 from the wild and bombastic Macho Man and watched on as Savage scooped up the Intercontinental Championship as he established himself as one of the greatest in-ring talents in the entire company. Macho's overprotectiveness of Elizabeth would be exploited by his opponents, and the nefarious Savage would even use Elizabeth as a shield in order to hit the faces with a sly dig here and there. As Savage moved up the card and turned babyface, Elizabeth stood by him every step of the way, watching on as Savage became WWE Champion at WrestleMania 4 and later managing the awesome Mega Powers as Savage teamed with Hulk Hogan. Again, Randy's possessiveness got the better of him, with Macho Man turning heel after ruthless attacking Hogan, thinking that the Hulkster was making advances on Elizabeth. Liz would walk away, but would return to Savage's side several years later in one of WrestleMania's most iconic moments. In a world where everyone was an over-the-top caricature, Miss Elizabeth shone by being a normal human being, unafraid to show her vulnerability as well as effortless class. Number 7. Mr. Fuji A multi-time tag team champion in the Fed, Mr. Fuji swapped his ring tights for a tuxedo and bowler hat in 1985, becoming part of the new breed of dark heel managers as the remaining members of the Triumvirate of Terror wound down their careers. With his trusty cane and a pocket full of blinding salt, Fuji managed the affairs of George Steele and Don Morocco before taking charge of the awesome Demolition. With Fuji on hand to break the rules, Demolition marched to the top of the tag division, winning the tag titles and holding them for a record-setting 478 days. Fuji would eventually turn on the team for the inferior powers of pain, though. Silly sod. Fuji would bounce around from client to client until 1992, when he ditched the tux for a kimono and ushered the terrifying Yokozuna into the mainstream. With Fuji once again on hand to chuck salt in opponents' eyes, Yoko bulldozed the entire roster to win the Royal Rumble, land two WWE Championships, crush Lex Luger's main event hopes, and ended up tagging with Owen Hart to land the tag titles just for fun. Fuji would stay at Yoko's side, even when he was usurped by Jim Cornette, and would corner Yoko going into WrestleMania 12 before retiring from the business. Number 6. Jim Cornette Everyone's favourite internet asshole, Jim Cornette is undoubtedly one of the finest managers in wrestling history. After his legendary run in the NWA, Jim formed Smoky Mountain Wrestling and eventually made his way to WWE, serving as the American spokesman for champion Yokozuna. Dressed in ugly suits and ready to smack a bastard with a tennis racket, Cornette would get 
get heat like few could, working in tandem with Mr. Fuji as Yoko mowed down everyone in sight. Off the back of this, Cornet formed Camp Cornet, with Yoko, Owen Hart, and the British Bulldogs serving as the de facto heel crew of the new generation, holding two tag titles during their run. Not satisfied with the amount of beef at his disposal, Cornet only went and brought in Vader, with the Mastodon debuting by clattering Gorilla Monsoon before marching his way into the main event scene. After Camp Cornet, James E would serve as the mouthpiece for the odd NWA invasion of 1997, which was something, before bringing actual killing machine Dan Seven into the company, complete with about 15 championship title belts. Whilst his WWE run never reached the heights of his run with the Midnight Express, Cornette packed as much in as he could, and if you needed a bombastic hyper mic man, then you could do worse than give old Jim a call. Number 5. Sensational Sherry With Vince McMahon deciding that he was bored of women's wrestling, Sherry Martel was left in limbo, with the former WWE Women's Champion transitioning full-time into a managerial role after moonlighting for several years. First cornering Intercontinental Champion Honky Tonk Man as Peggy Sue, Martel would truly flourish as the frankly bonkers Queen Sherry at the side of the Macho King Randy Savage. Whereas Miss Elizabeth juxtaposed Savage's madness with her calming presence, Presence, Sensational Sherry exacerbated it, screaming loads of twaddle about evil magic and destruction whilst occasionally painted like a cat. Absolutely bonkers. After kicking Savage to the curb after he lost a retirement match to the Ultimate Warrior, Sherry would shack up with Ted DiBiase, and although Ted was past his prime, he was still a massive star, and the always aggro Sherry would step in to give someone a literal shooing when needed. Sherry's last major run in WWE came at the side of the newly heel singles breakout star Shawn Michaels, with Sherry besotted with the sexy boy. Shawn, being a complete bastard, pulled Sherry in harm's way when Marcy Jannetty attempted to smash his head in with a mirror, and Sherry would take a bash to the head so hard she would abandon both rockers and corner to Tonka instead. Yikes. Number 4. Jimmy Hart After making his name in Memphis as the chief foil to Jerry Lawler, Jimmy Hart made his way to WWE in 1985 and instantly added some pedigree to his client base, cornering Intercontinental Champion Greg Valentine. The Mouth of the South would also guide the Dream Team with Johnny V before forming a new team to take the tag division by storm when he brought Jim Neidhart and Bret Hart together as the Hart Foundation. Hart would also manage the funks at this time and would dub himself the Colonel when cornering a newly heel Honky Tonk Man, keeping a close eye as he became a record-breaking Intercontinental Champion. Clearly, Jimmy Hart had the golden touch. Incessantly screaming into his megaphone made sure that he was roundly booed week in, week out, and when his charges were at a disadvantage, then Jimmy would not hesitate to use it as a weapon. His chicanery ensured that the Nasty Boys wrangled the belts away from Bret and Anvil at WrestleMania 7, with Jimmy using his helmet as a foreign object. Weirdly, Jimmy would end up fulfilling the rare role of a babyface manager in WWE, when after runs with the Natural Disasters and Tag Champs Money Inc., Jimmy would begin to represent Brutus Beefcake and Hulk Hogan, cornering the Hulkster to his WWE Championship win at WrestleMania 9. Oh, and he also wrote HBK's theme too, Legend. Number 3. Paul Bearer Quite frankly, the Undertaker and Brother Love pairing was not a good fit. What the dead man needed was some kind of mortuary assistant or a Paul Bearer to look after his affairs. Step forward, Paul Bearer. Oh, now I get it. A pasty faced grim mortician plucked straight from a universal horror flick and plonked next to the phenom, complete with a mystical urn that contained either fog, smoke, a massive light, or actual human ashes, depending on what day it was. The addition of Bearer completed the Taker gimmick, with Bearer creepily praising his Undertaker, cutting the promos whilst Taker just stood there being all tall and dead. The two remained together for six years, with Taker lifting the WWE Championship during this time, before Bearer betrayed Taker and sided with the deranged Mankind as well as a short spell with Vader. With Mankind, Bearer changed his act somewhat, but was still a creepy little ghoul of a man, with his wretchedness going to new heights when he unleashed Kane on the world at Bad Blood 97. Don't worry though, because after Kane, Bearer settled down. Sorry, no he didn't. He formed the Ministry of Darkness with Taker and tried embalming people on live TV. 
Bearer was campy, over the top, and utterly ridiculous, but that's why he was so good. He made us believe that a pair of seven foot magic zombies could squash a combat league and could command the audience simply by saying, oh yes. Number two, Paul Heyman. Quite simply, one of the greatest talkers and most brilliant minds in wrestling history, Paul Heyman was the mastermind behind the awesome Dangerous Alliance in WCW before changing the entire pro wrestling industry with ECW in the mid 90s. After ECW died and was bought by WWE, Heyman joined the company first as a commentator, then as the mouthpiece for the disastrous alliance with Shane and Stephanie McMahon. However, as an on screen force in WWE, Heyman was just getting started and further changed the landscape of the business when he brought Brock Lesnar to our screens. Presiding over the next big things affairs, Heyman did the deals and the talking as Brock literally ate everyone who challenged him in the Fed. Heyman would also look after main event talents, The Big Show and Kurt Angle. Then, after Brock left town, Heyman would depart the company, returning to run the ill fated WWE CW, including a second stint as ECW champion Big Show's manager. However, it wasn't until Brock Lesnar returned that Heyman truly cemented himself as the best in the business, advocating for the beast as Brock snapped arms and collected championships for fun. With Brock only working when he could be bothered, Heyman made himself useful by joining the biggest star in the company, CM Punk, which was also incredible. Okay, so his runs with Curtis Axel and Cesaro were false dawns, but Heyman always fit Brock well, and when a newly healed Roman Reigns needed a special counsel, who else was fit for the job but Paul Heyman? A once-in-a-generation talker who masterminded dozens of world title wins, Heyman is for many the greatest manager of all time. But for us, there's one better. Number one, Bobby Heenan. The measuring stick by which all managers are compared to, Bobby the Brain Heenan could make chicken salad out of chicken sludge and could turn a great talent into a legend. The brains behind the nefarious Heenan family, Bobby surrounded himself with winners and future Hall of Famers, throwing his weight behind the likes of Harley Race, the Brain Busters, Ravishing Rick Rude, Mr. Perfect, Paul Orndorff, Haku, and a little known talent named Andre the Giant. Indeed, it was Heenan's corrupting of career babyface Andre that was his greatest work, getting inside the legend's head as he sought to use him as a weapon in his fight against Hulkamania, with Heenan advising Andre for his monumental clash with Hogan at WrestleMania 3. Quick-witted, oozing credibility, and not afraid to look a bit of a bellend and bump like a madman to get the face over, the weasel turned the role of a wrestling manager into an art form, whilst also cementing himself as one of the greatest color commentators of all time too. The show off. Although Brain would concentrate more on his announcing work as the 90s rolled on, he would still retain some impressive clients, bringing in the real world's champion Ric Flair to WWE in 1991, and later following that with the introduction of the narcissist Lex Luger. Put simply, no one could do it quite like Heenan, and whilst many have come close, none will ever possess the brain that Bobby Heenan did.